I will reconvene us. Um, Kim has her daughter's, um, it's senior night for the soccer team, um, so um, she wants to be there for her daughter. And Liz is out of town. So, um, Beth, I'm going to turn it over to you for the book read discussion. Okay. So you received your homework about the four A's that you were to collect, which was an assumption, what you agree with, what you want to argue with the text about, and then anything that you aspire to or want to act, want to act upon. So we are go you're going to get into groups of, I had it in my head if everybody was here. Let's see. <laughs> Three. How about groups of three and one group will be of four? Okay, maybe the four, could one could go with Brendan and then the um, Laura and Grace, or Laura and Grace can split, whatever. But, and once you're there in your groups, I will give you directions and we'll go over the directions, but I just didn't waste a lot of paper for the directions, okay? So if you can split up into groups. I'm not going to be in a group, I'm going to rotate around. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. I'll join. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Amy can join. Um. <laughs> Two of us. Actually, you guys could join um, Marla and Patrick. Maybe okay. Because Amy's over here. Sure. just nudge them and say, everybody needs a turn, okay? <laughs> and so round one, you'll have each person identify one assumption in the text, citing the text and the page number. So if somebody wants to refer to it, you'll want to point out where it is. Oh, dear. Um, and if you didn't do that, that's okay. That's okay. Um, round two, then you'll go through the next A, and you'll go all the way through the three and four. Right? I think it's clear in the direction. When we come back together as a whole group and you're done, and we may have to end depending on the time, I'll keep an eye on it because we're a little, um, we have less time. And then as a whole group, we'll talk about the ahas. And then what does it mean for your board work after you read that chapter? So we'll share some things that way. All right? All right. Go for it. Okay. So. First, sure. first round, which will be you two. Uh, an assumption, an assumption. Yes. Yes. All right, I can answer okay. Okay. Because the assumption literally, the sentence was, the reader is undoubtedly familiar with the blues taxonomy. My question is, I'm actually not. I wonder <laughs> not at all for how much why. Steve's going to be a subject. Yeah, I think that's an assumption you know, for the race to identity, uh, equity, uh, uh, diversity, uh, uh, maybe uh, students get it a lot of thoughts. Maybe yeah. I don't okay. what happened in, in That's okay. In that's good. Yeah. The yeah. government for a long time. Yeah. 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 a very diverse group. For an audience that I am not initially a part of. I mean, I could absolutely I know, shut right down reading it. it I gave up. I felt like when they got into stuff about like the founding fathers and like the history of equity in schools, like that was interesting to me. Like I would love to have a conversation about this that dealt with like history, sociology, and philosophy. 
but management isn't really, I mean, I'm not supposed to manage the schools. So. No. <laughs> like, I want to understand what equity is, and I think the assumption here is that the people who are reading this like, already have an idea what equity is, and they just need to know how to do it. Implement. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I can see that. I think that, yeah, I do think that that was, I, I didn't have, like, I was I didn't get to that point and then stop being able to follow it, but I definitely hit that point and realized that there were going to be portions of the upcoming chapter that were going to refer to things that I just had no background in. And I was I definitely it. correct. Yeah. <laughs> so, what's the definition of taxonomy? <laughs> I read it, but I didn't have an interest in it. That it's terrible, but I didn't. Which part of it, or like, at what point did you think I that it just think, wasn't going to? I go? think. Well, it's probably. I think it's so much like the what you would hope would happen and not the reality because as I'm reading this their idea of equity and I go back to my son being in school he could have one teacher teaching something that he blossomed with and it was because how the teacher asked questions how they gave homework how they interacted with the classroom he could go to another teacher's classroom and shut right down and it was because of the rules in the classroom or how the teacher spoke or whatever. So my, I guess my assumption from reading this is that, but I always expected teachers and how they should be talking to kids. That was always my assumption that should be the way that they treat and philosophy, but to get there to reality, I just, I just, from having had one in there a long time ago, I just don't see it happening, you know, out of how many staff yeah. members. So that was kind of so, I'm not sure I saw it as that specific. Like, I thought that it was speaking more from a, you know, like a student population level and less an individual classroom level, but it's possible that that may have been something that they kind of transitioned to. I think it got into what Marla was talking about on like level four, which we haven't read the chapter on level four yet, but that seemed to be where they're like, really able teachers make a big difference. But I might be mixing up my levels so I can memorize them. <laughs> so, I, so I took that away from it, basically. But whether it's reality, no. How about you, Andre? Um, I think I was gravitating on that uh, example of the uh, teacher retiring and then the replacement came in and started being more inclusive with reading. One who integrated uh, the title. disabled students into yes. into the classroom instead of pulling them out right. for separate and instruction. Yes, uh, became more inclusive and um, it was really attempting to address all yeah, I mean, I and like everyone's needs in an inclusive environment rather than yeah. shuffling or splitting the class or shuffling them off. Okay. Our five minutes on assumptions is up. So should we move on to what we agreed with in the text? I wrote in my margins, I have to find. <laughs> I didn't write, I don't know if we have to turn these back in or not. <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't write I in it. It's okay I, to write I, it. I didn't dare day. write in it. I figured we'd be turning it in. Now, were we just supposed to just read chapter one or read one? Yeah, just chapter one. Oh, okay. oh um, so I love to. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 enjoyed reading the stories about like changes that schools had put into place that worked for them um, and I thought that the idea of offering supports that enabled parents who otherwise would not be able to to volunteer in the classroom was great that they like installed laundry machines and yes. offered either services or the opportunity to spend time in their kids' class. Yes. To parents who like were struggling with language or poverty or whatever. And I thought that was a great idea. I don't know how relevant it is to our district, but like I've always thought about like how the people volunteering in the classroom are all like 
reasonably like me in some way. Like, their family has enough money and enough time to come and be in the classroom, but it's a great experience for my kid, and it's a great experience for me. So if we were able to offer, like, pay people to volunteer in the schools, you know, or something, so that they could get some time off of their two jobs, like, then they would get to have that opportunity with their kid, you know? Yes. Dwell into as to why they can't volunteer and see what we can do to break down that barrier. Yeah, I, I found a lot of value in the specific examples as well. Actually, the one that I agreed with was the one that you brought up about the uh, you know the example that they gave, um, bringing Title One students back into the classroom instead of pulling them out for it, um, which I thought was definitely where we kind of want to be. Yes. Moving towards, you know. Um, the other one that gravitated on as well was the uh, recognition of diversity. And a good example was um, the hijab, with the, the Muslim wearing the hijab and not necessarily understanding, but not, not researching why. That's what I was a little bit bothered by, that they fell to the letter of the policy that no headgear or hats or whatnot, but not researching why, why they're doing, why they're wearing. I found that that in particular has always been kind of a, I don't know, I guess. So I know that there are countries where, like, is it burqas that are banned? Like the full on? Like, um, France bans just like France and everything and France. like that. France and They're very restrictive of uh, religious expression in the schools. Well, I think right. they've had a lot more terrorism, and so um, you can hide a lot more under I think it's those gone, envel you know, things that. Gone beyond just the schools. Well, but I, I mean, think. wearing a scarf on your head, like. Oh, they ban that. Yeah. Yeah. And like I thought seven it was years ago, like all the little French Catholic girls would have been wearing lace on their head <laughs> like, oh, wow. for the same exact reason. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, geez. Like, yeah, that's what up? France, I think, takes it too far, but luckily <laughs> we're not doing that. <laughs> so. The. Um, one thing I noticed in here a lot was the restorative practices that they talked about. And it seems to go along with how we're doing discipline and things, so it made me think of our executive sessions with student matters. And I'm not sure how that could be approached, but I would say I agree with restorative practices. Uh, legitimately, will it work? And let, if you you have cases where you have to have a student removed from school, that I think is dangerous or or totally disrupting. But um, the restorative practices, I think, is something we as a board need to discuss more in our um, discipline and the issues we've encountered and how to solve that or come up with or track how many happen one year and can we get the numbers down another year and not just by hiding it under the rug but you know so I know we use the community justice center too for some of the people that we have dealt with in executive session oh, okay. so that's been really we are that, that helps <laughs> <laughs> that helps huh yes that's been awesome right. uh, okay. five minutes so okay on to disagreement. Yeah, we want to argue with that. I wanted to argue with a lot, but that's just coming from like. <laughs> I I don't have one specific example. I just think this is like, like I said, I think the heads are in the clouds on this. There's a basis of of a little bit of reality with you've got so many staff. How do you ensure getting them all to that point? And, and is it realistic to have that bar, or do you reach it by degrees? So mine is that overall thought process of that. Okay, how, you know, you take it piecemeal, but 
It isn't going to happen overnight, that's no. for sure. Baby steps. <laughs> Sorry, small steps. Um, I kind of went with the low hanging fruit one again for stuff I wanted to argue with um, because they explicitly said, like, not everyone's going to agree with this one. In fact, there may be a lot of disagreement. So they said how they did not think that uh, specific gender related classes were a strength and the example they gave were that it was some schools where um, where girls were having you know either difficulty or were not as interested in science they had set up you know sort of like girls only science labs or girls only like extra science sessions um, and I guess from what I remember reading the text, they said that there were mixed results. Like there were some positives that they found and that there were some negatives that they found, but that they didn't think that that was something that should occur like at any point. And I do think that there might be some value. Like I could definitely see that rather than prohibiting it outright, if it was, especially if it was a, I mean, two, I won't say this completely now, now, but I, actually that's a bad example. I mean, I also had issues around their concept of integration and how it related to gender, because I think that they laid down as a blanket good that classrooms should be diverse. And I think that it's pretty clear from our nation's history that, like, people suffer when the classrooms are not diverse. Yes. And generally, it's underprivileged groups who suffer more. And so you could expect that a classroom that was all white people would probably be getting a better education than a classroom that was all black people. A classroom that was all men would probably be getting a better education than a classroom that was all women. And so for the whole population, integration is better. The question when you get down to something like a classroom full of girls, is there something where you can offer a high enough standard of education to the underprivileged group to make it more worthwhile for them and for everyone to not integrate? And my personal belief is no. Um, my cousin's going to Smith right now, she's having a great time. I know a lot of people who got a great education at Smith, I respect them a lot. My personal belief for myself has always been that one of the key skills to like life is going to be how I interact with men. So I can't learn that in an all-girls classroom. No. Even if it means that no boy can shout me down, I'm not going to learn how to interact with that boy who wants to shout me down from being in an all-girls classroom. And people have different views about that, but like the thing to do is to study it. Right. And the girls might be getting great networking, and we're probably not going to enhance networking by integrating people, but like there's got to be areas of diversity and areas of segregation that are more and less harmful both to the students in the room and to the society as a whole. And you need data rather than assumptions. Right, because I think the same argument is for the homeschool is the lack of social skills. <laughs> Is sometimes the, the consequence of that. Some kids can get a lot from being. You can wrap school. up your conversations right. in the next. Yeah, there's minute. other things that they're missing out on. Yes. Or that other people are missing out on from not having. Push it down so we have a little. Think, going back to your woman, uh, the all girls in a classroom. I could argue that just from all the science labs when I was in high school, we did better. We girls, because we'd have two girls as lab partners, you know, you gravitate towards your friends. And the physics teacher actually was pretty cool. He put a guy, if you were two girls, he had one of the guys in our group, and vice versa, if you had two guys. And how he did it, it didn't seem like he was forcing it. It seemed like for some reason there's some odd numbers in here and we've got to straighten it out. And we actually learned, the guys learned differently than we did, so it made our labs and it made us stronger. I mean, we got better grades 
with our group. And I don't know if it's because of us, but one of the guys that we partnered one at one time wasn't one of the better okay, students. Okay, if you could wrap and up and come back, we'll have a whole group So I don't discussion. know if it's competition with Please. a male being in the group. Well, I mean, all the arguments for, like, inclusion in a business environment are, like, different perspectives to make it better for everyone. So, yeah. <coughs> I didn't write down any aha uh -huh moments. I don't think there's any aha uh -huh moments. I think the only thing is we all agreed on the okay. So, if you would like to share out, did anybody have any ahas that you want to share with the whole group? And even from the reading, but also maybe that you came up with something as a group. Any new learning or ahas? I, our group, I'll, I'll say it, I think we all felt that this was written more from a teaching teacher's perspective and it started off right away with uh, terminology that we have no clue about in my case it shut me right down uh, other people I mean I did read it and keep going but there's some terminology in here and we all four of us said that 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 was in the beginning and they state that oh everybody knows about this well if you're a teacher you probably do we didn't know those terms so that was, I think, an aha moment. <laughs> or an, oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. It oh is dear. written by four educators. <laughs> yeah, I think it was, the, it was the, uh, the literal assumption where they said, of course, the reader is familiar with Bloom's taxonomy. And we're like, uh, mm, yeah, right. Um, I think for me, uh, there was a lot of focus on, or maybe, maybe this was an assumption, that we need to work really hard to make sure that students um, have, there's, there's physical integration, as well as an integration of experience and a diverse student body. But there wasn't a lot of discussion about whether or how um, schools should focus on having a diverse faculty and whether or not that matters in terms of the student's experience, that as you have a changing demographic uh, uh, in terms of your student body, how important is it to also be mindful of the fact that your, um, your faculty, the adults in the buildings, also represent or reflect that changing diversity? that the book essentially says that they're doomed. Um, but no, seriously, it's on page 14. Um, that they're doomed, that, 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 that it's, it's not within their purview to change. Okay, and as, as, as part of the board, administration sort of thing, we can do, indeed have the power to change a lot of this um, by, by enacting policies and practices. So, and I'm going, so learned helplessness is not a good thing. Okay, but essentially that, there, that statement says, you've already learned helplessness. Where's the advocacy that you should be having as educators? To You tell me that you want these kids to get boosted up and moved and all this advocacy. And yet you have that, that one paragraph that says, learned helplessness. I'm, I'll, give them, I'll forgive them. Okay, because they do redeem themselves later. But I, um, but I mean, as an administrator, okay, I go, hmm, okay. That's not encouraging. You're talking to me about the empowering people in diversity, but you're going to tell me that you can't? Well, I, I understand that, but they should at least say, hey, conversations with administration are always good. You know. but. Any others? What do you think it means for your work as board member? If anything. I think that it's going to 
challenge us in a way that if we're looking for integration in a 96% white community, that we have to look at other factors that we need to be integrating. And I don't know if that necessarily means looking at the population of like free reduced lunch in EJ versus Essex Town versus Westford and potentially moving students, you know, from EJ schools out to the town or Westford to reflect diversity in specific neighborhoods or areas. But I mean, clearly our challenges are gonna be very different than if we were in Mississippi or Louisiana. And our city, Detroit. Yeah. Yeah. It did make me think about do we have any specific school buildings that have particular concentrations of population? And as I said in Harvard, <coughs> in Westford, every child who lives in Westford, unless they're homeschooled or private school, comes to that building. But mm -hmm. When you have more than one school, it could be different. I guess Essex Town just really has one school for each grade. So it would, it would only be an issue in the village. I'm going to go to Keeley. Yes. So I, I think I thought about that as well, because it's like, so what's the solution to a perceived lack of diversity? Is it to like go and recruit some people from Louisiana <laughs> to come to our school, or is it to recognize the other dimensions of diversity that are already present in the school building. And I thought that the um, diagram on page 17, which laid out a whole bunch of dimensions of identity, was helpful in that. Because if you think about it, you could have a room full of a whole bunch of white people mm -hmm. from Essex Junction, and it includes Bosnian Muslims who are going to be, because of their names and their religion, experiencing a high degree of discrimination when they try to fly in an airplane or something, you know, that might be more similar to the experience of somebody in this country who appears to be an Arab. Um, so I think there's a lot of different ways that we could recognize existing diversity and think about are we recognizing that and not just assuming that everybody is the same because 96% of us are the same in one particular dimension. Yeah. I agree. I talked about growing sorry, Mara. I talked about growing up in the Northeast Kingdom on the Canadian border and what a large French Canadian population there was and the kind of discrimination they faced, the the slang words that were used to refer to them, the fact that many of them had French as their first language, you know. So if you looked at them, you wouldn't see diversity. But in fact, what they experienced was the same as what had other populations experienced because of the color of their skin or their religion mm -hmm. or whatever. Martha, I'm sorry. I, uh, you know, we talked about it on the Prudential Committee at one point because a couple parents had said that there's a lot of apartments and a lot of those students go to Summit Street versus Hiawatha had Wickham Woods and some of the Lang Farm at going over there. And so a couple parents had questioned that um, Summit seemed to be a lower socioeconomic school versus Hiawatha. So I don't know if that's still the degree today, but I would be curious how they compare K through three. It'd be something for us as a board that's a way of starting, I think, to look at it and making sure the kids, especially if we have busing, um, and I won't be running for the school board again this spring, but I think to actually get the true diversity you're going to need in the junction, if you do have the busing, you probably want to look at grade reorg instead of the K through three on separate sides of the town. But then you're in the culture of the neighborhood, community people have moved around those schools. The houses around Summit aren't as high a priced as away from those areas. so. I think that would be a place to start looking. That would give us some uh, data, I think, if that was checked into. Yeah. I think that, you know, just as important as it is to think about 
the physical integration of our student body. On page 23, they talked about also making sure that people have an integrated experience. And that you can't just I mean, you can't just put people, you know, in different buildings and be like, there we're now, you know, we're now diverse. Um, <laughs> You know, I think I think it is important. You know, looking at that is definitely the first step. But then also, how are you going to make sure that the educational experiences that they're having lead to um, experiences that teach them to be collaborative and respectful and understand each other? And I think that's the other part of the equation. But you know, both of them are important. Okay, I'm going to suggest since we're already ten minutes behind. Yeah, we need to this up. Um, how far should we be for next time? What's our assignment? Chapter? Point? Another chapter, so chapter two. Okay. I am not here next time. Do you want two weeks to do it, or do you want... Oh. It's a long chapter. It is a longer chapter. You could put it on for the second um, one. November. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Give so, you more time to read. So, everyone, I'm going to Oh, I just had it and I closed my book. 69 appears to be the last page. Of the okay. Martha, so, Martha has something quick to yes. say. Yes. Um, one of the things that I also wanted to talk about super fast is on um, like the diversity thing with. Um, while we might not have a lot of a lot of ethnic diversity, I know that we do have a lot of. Um, like gender identity diversity and, mm -hmm. and like transgender sexual orientation things and one of the things that I've noticed is that on course expectations that teachers hand out at the beginning of classes they usually always say like your student he she or like your like they never say they and it's like coming into a class and being like gender fluid gender neutral not really knowing where you stand and, the, and then like having a teacher like not really include you in the very beginning of the class thing or like in English class being taught that they them is not a, a proper way of, of um, introducing one person is like is just not inclusive mm -hmm. and yeah. Being being in our school, accepting that, I think it should show on paper too. It's an excellent point. Very good point. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So we'll move on to comments from the public for items not on the agenda. I assume our reporter doesn't want to comment. So, <laughs> pardon. Okay, so I'll move on to the consent agenda. Does anyone want to pull anything from the consent agenda? If not, Marla, you're back. I, I had to do this last time. I will move that we approve the consent agenda with the following items. School board meeting minutes of October 2nd, 2018. A uh, professional appointment of Carla Pinto, Hiawatha ELL teacher, who will be a temporary full-time for one year. And then approval of the 60-month financing lease for Dell Financial Services and approval of warrants. Okay. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same name. Okay, great. Amy Cole, you are up and we're back on time. Look at that. Look at that. Okay. You have a hard copy of all the slides. Do so yep. you have it sitting in front of you? No. Nope, don't. Right. I have more. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think you do have more. Um, I, I want to make sure that you get your questions answered and, and um, we spend enough time with you, you know, I could just keep going with graphs. So that I really want you to stop me if you have questions. Um, I started with just a little bit of background information. 
So I'll go over that with you. And I have some additional attachments um, just to show you some of the work that we've been doing as a new district around the use of our data system and some of the reports that are going home to parents. So depending on what, I know I don't have a ton of time, what, you, what it is that you want to talk about, you know, send me in that direction. You know I can talk. Um, some quick, um, mind hitting the, that's okay. Just some quick, um, you're probably aware of this, but just some updates in terms of changes to our state um, assessment systems. So we, those of you who have been around long enough to remember NECAP, or those of you who have been around long enough to remember an SRE, um, we are on our third state assessment, SBEC. Um, we have had SBEC in place for English language arts and math for four years now. Um, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about students who have been taking this test for four years. I'll bet you guys are some of them. Um, one change that did occur this year was that they changed the high school assessment from grade 11 to grade 9. If you remember that last year when we did our presentations, mm -hmm. that was the last year that we were going to see grade 11. Um, and so that will be interesting for us to look at those results to see if we notice anything different. We have two additional state assessments that were rolled out this spring, so our, our system experienced two new pilots at the same time that we were administering SBAC. Um, and um, it's part of the Vermont State um, Plan for ESSA. So one, um, science kneecap is no longer in place. We have a pilot, or ran a pilot called VTSA, Vermont Science Assessment, in grades, and I do have to look because they kept changing grades on us for all of our assessments. In grades four, eight, and 11, we ran that last spring in May. They will be running it again this year. Um, as part of the pilot, we initially were told we were not gonna be receiving any results. Now we've been told we won't receive individual student results, but we'll receive school scores. And we haven't seen that yet. We've been told maybe November or December. So when we've received those scores, I'll let you know. It was a computer-based assessment. Um, and then we also um, administered the new, what they're now calling the VTPEA, the Vermont Physical Education Assessment. It was rolled out last spring in grades four, seven, and 10. They've made the decision this year that they're changing it from grade 10 to grade nine. And that is Fitnessgram. It's a piece of software that some of our teachers were used to using. Both of our, all three of these are now included in our state accountability system. So as they start to roll out the new state state accountability system, those are the three sets of data points that will be included. And I just wanted to explain in 2018, and maybe you picked up on this or not, the results were delayed. There was a, a little bit of confusion about them. We receive our student results in June. In fact, as soon as a student finishes 10 days later, we can print out their report. But we're told we need to hang on to it until the entire school finishes because there's a school average on that report. Um, we were then told in July that we could release those to students, and so we did, and put them up on our website. And then partway through August, they announced there was a mistake on the math assessment, and it was going to impact eighth grade math score, so hold off a little bit. We did receive our scores uh, two weeks ago. It didn't change our overall scores in any way, but we did pull those students for whom there may be a, a new report that we need to send home. So we got those today, and we'll be sending those out. It didn't change the state average for Vermont um, in terms of math. It was grade eight math, and it didn't change our district average. So whatever scores were on our website actually didn't change. So that's my quick explanation. Now, the results. You don't mind clicking on the next one. So again, we're on our fourth year. I have all four years up there. And I did go back and co-mingle the former two districts together to um, arrive at the 2015 and 16 numbers. One of the things that we tend to do is we move our eyes left to right. So how did third grade do in 2015, 16, then 17, then 18? And if you move from left to right, you think these are different groups of students. But what, maybe what's happening in grade three or grade four? And on our fourth year of giving this assessment, I have to say there's, you know, there's, there's ups and downs. There's not a whole lot of things that are like really kind of grab our attention on that. One of the things that we've been warned to look at was at grade three and grade six in, in math, that those are real high um, bump up years in the Common Core Standards and whether or not we would see some big sort of difference there. We haven't so far. If you go, um, Beth, to the next one, it's the same slide, but then what we do is we start looking at, so those third grade students went to fourth grade, went to fifth grade, went to sixth grade. Do we notice anything there? Are there things happening with groups of students? With the idea that students move in and out, you know, um, at about a 30% rate from grade K through eight, we know students move in and out, but are, is there something remarkable that's kind of going on, either with a cohort or a particular grade where we start to see a drop? And again, we're on our fourth year, and. We get all excited about you know, thinking that we see a trend and then the next year the trend shifts on us a little bit. So I'm sad to say we, we haven't had any big ahas from these results. We've been fairly consistent. We tend to average, just like the state, 
We average higher on language arts than we do on math. Um, when I did the average of um, three through nine straight through, and then when I did the average of grade three over four years, we tend to arrive at about the same place. We're higher in language arts than we are in math, and that reflects a state trend as well. We don't have, and I apologize because I know that this is an important part of your conversation, particularly since you're equity, we don't have our disaggregated results yet. This, one of the other holdups is that the state has not completed its new census collection process. So not only do we not have state disaggregated results, but we don't have our school disaggregated results. I can't tell you what our achievement gaps are right now. I have to assume they're going to look pretty similar. But when they do come out, I'm happy to come back and share them with you. I just don't have anything to share with you publicly right now. Um, one of the things that we can see in our new system, if you, I'm not sure if you remember, but we, we used to run two different assessment data systems where we collected our student data and analyzed it in the former Essex Town and Chittenden Central. This is the first year that we rolled out a common system called Alpine. And one of the things that we, there's a lot of things we like about this, this, this system. It's very easy to use, it's visually appealing. The vendor's been really great to work with. But they've also helped us see data in different ways. And one of the reports that, that I'm particularly excited about, and I put it in front of our teachers, and it's funny, I was at ADL when I put it in front of the teachers and they did it like an aha, like, a, like, like the fireworks, they went oh. um, What this graph represents is that if you take our students, you know, students fall into four proficiencies on our state assessments. Mm -hmm. If you take them and then within those four proficiencies break them further into thirds, you can start to see do we have particular cohorts of students that are falling sort of high on the low end or um, low on the high end and start to see if we see some trends there. This one right now represents um, three through nine commingled, but I ran it for every single grade level and it's a very similar trend. So our students who are performing in that lowest proficiency level, that below or that beginning or that number one, we have a very high percentage of them that are just over the cusp or ready to move into the twos. We have a similar dynamic for um, language arts, not, not as stark. Um, you can see a little bit higher bar on that, sort of the twos moving into threes. Um, not so much in math. We're fairly, fairly kind of um, evenly distributed across the, um, the almost proficient and the proficient band. Mm -hmm. And it's um, pretty common across all of our grade levels that those that are in the expanding or the exceeding, that, that fourth highest one, the highest percentage are at that very first, that first third, um, which is hard to, they're, they're expanding. So we're excited about that. We're not going to be too upset that they're in the lowest part of that, but it's, it was an interesting trend for us to look at. Patrick? I don't want to interrupt the, no, it's okay. the, the flow of the conversation, but just quickly while we're on here, is are these results that we should be looking at um, that, Beth, that you've mentioned that you want to see every third grader yeah. reading at level? Yep. So at level here, would that be the third category meets, or would that be? It would be, and I'm actually going to get to that question a little bit further okay. in the slides. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you, though. I do get caught up in educational jargon, and if there's things that I say, like proficient levels or threes, please stop yeah, me. I just wanted to connect yep. you know, something that's been important and brought to us a couple of times before with mm -hmm. results. Yeah, I, I intentionally ended on that one because I wanted to bring it back to you. Some other things just so that we can, when we look at the whole language arts score or when we look at the whole math score, we want to break it into its parts to figure out are we doing better in terms of reading or writing or research or particular math strengths that we're doing better at. Um, Fairly level across the board for English language arts. Um, writing is an area that we want to focus on. It's an area that we're building a new common writing assessment for. It's one of those areas that we know is a key area for success academically. So I'm disappointed that our writing has the higher number of students who are not proficient than the other areas, but by and large, they're fairly even. We've got 85% um, of our students, according to the English language arts reading subscore, reading on grade level and that's again three through nine combined 82 percent for writing 89 for listening and 88 for research and inquiry what we don't have is a satisfactory answer in terms of how those four subscores actually sugar up and cause the total overall ela what we know is the percentage of students proficient on ela is always far lower than these four numbers and we've not yet gotten an answer in terms of how these four cause that number um, if you look at math, there are three subsections in math that they report out on concepts and procedures, problem solving, modeling, and data analysis, and communicating reasoning. And concepts and procedures is an area that it looks like we need some work on. It's a very broad category. In other words, it's all content strands 
So it doesn't break it out for us in terms of how are we doing on geometry, how are we doing on place value. The um, interim assessment does provide that when we provide when we were able to provide that to our students, but our, our state scores don't provide that information. So, so, so what? So the next slide I shared with you, and I apologize because I thought I had printed it for you. It is on our website. It's probably sitting on the printer, but I gave you a pretty screenshot of our first comment assessment plan. So we ran two different assessment systems last year and different assessments because we really wanted to work with the teachers through a change process to get them there. This is the first year that we have common assessments across all of our buildings. Um, Sorry. And <laughs> so what that looks like when I give it to you, and I can pull it up for you if you'd like, is that all kindergarten students, regardless of the building, had the same common assessments administered this fall. And we were able to put them into our data system and be able to look across all of our kindergarten classrooms. And then using our Collaborative Tuesdays, our district-wide PLCs, all 15 kindergarten teachers sat together and looked at. So how did our students do across all buildings in terms of their letter identification, their sound identification? Um, all of our third grade teachers sat together and looked at our local, our common local math assessment and said, how are we doing on place value? And so it gave us a nice place to have a conversation with teachers who really met for the first time as a common district day. Ooh. So um, we have common reading and math assessments. Uh, we have common assessment windows now. And this is something that we, both systems experienced changes. So both systems needed a lot of support to get to something in common. And both systems we've said we're taking feedback this year. If we need a longer window or a shorter window or less assessments, but it was our first shot out of the gate building something in common across many buildings. Um, we had common data collection and reporting in our system called Alpine Achievement, which allows us to look at our data um, much more easily. We are working towards building a common local writing assessment. We decided in terms of with so much change to not put that one. So each of the systems are running their own writing assessments right now, and we're going to move towards a common one next year. Um, we're holding off on any build of any common local writing tasks or writing assessments until this, this, state, this new state science assessment kind of sugars out and we can try to figure out what it is that we can get out of it. Because sometimes when we get an, a state assessment that provides information, you want a similar task that, that gives you another opportunity to see if they're doing it sort of in the same way or in a different setting. And sometimes, depending on what information you get from the state, you want a very different assessment so you can figure out so for example, in math, we wanted ones that had those content strands because the state didn't provide that. Um, the full assessment can be found on the website. So the other thing that I wanted to just share with you and you have a copy of it is that the K through five principals made the decision that they would like to three times a year send out assessment reports to our parents. And I gave you a copy of one and I blocked out a student's name on it. This is a report that was published out of our new system called Alpine. And really, it came from a place of the principals determining that they wanted to look at the way we communicate to our, our families about student progress. And in the letter, you'll see, um, you have a copy of the letter, you'll see the timeline um, of events that begin with the September curriculum nights. We have parent conferences in October, um, sending home the assessment reports, having a progress report in um, January. And so you'll see that timeline of those assessment windows and the communications that the K-5 principals really wanted to do in common and following the same timeline. It's notable, and you may hear this, that there was one change, and some families are, may not be happy with it, but the former CCSU schools, K-5, through fives, um, sent home progress reports three times a year on a trimester basis, and Essex Town did it twice a year. We needed to make a decision about what we were going to do in common. So the decision we made was to go with twice a year with the progress reports, but send home assessment reports, additional assessment reports three times a year. So that's what's, um, that was the decision that they made. So the families are receiving these letters um, K through five at the parent conferences this week. And Alpine has allowed us to do that. So what I wanna do now, sort of to Patrick's point, is to walk you through some of the local assessment data that we've collected so far because one of the things we want to do is make sure that our teachers have and our administrators have local assessment data that helps them identify where we have some curriculum gaps or where we have particular cohorts mm -hmm. of students who need particular support or individual students who need support. But we also wanted to look at, um, Beth and I looked at these as potential um, data points for your measurable outcomes for the continuous improvement plan. So I'll just give you a snapshot of a couple of them. These were the new common assessments that our kindergarten teachers gave this year. 
um, we found that this cohort, and it's always interesting to see every new kindergarten cohort come through and figure out where their strengths are and some areas that we need to build upon. Our kindergarten teachers are amazing. If you can imagine assessing five-year-olds um, within the first month of school, these are all one-on-one -on -one assessments, and they're all very, very short, but they give key information to teachers. And one is, can you identify letters? So 93% of our current kindergarten class could identify letters, which is great. Some years, that's lower than that. We also have an assessment that we give that tells us about their early literacy behaviors. Do they know what the, that a book has a front and a back? Do they know that there's a middle of a book? Do they know how to make their way through the book? Um, and our students came in pretty strong this year. We also have these high frequency words that we assess, and we assess that three times a year um, to figure out are there words that kids will, you know, sight words that they'd be able to recognize. Um, and about 75% of our kids met the benchmark there. And then we administered a new common math assessment this year, and we looked at uh, kindergarten students in terms of their ability to oral and, um, and write n um, numbers. 71% of our students met the benchmark there. So we know that those are students that are coming in with some areas that we need to give some extra supports for. And our operations was our lowest area. Our students' ability to be able to do basic kindergarten grade level operations was fairly low in this cohort. So what this does is it tells our math coaches this information and then it tells the teachers. These are areas that we need to put some extra supports in place. And I think that, yes, and there, they'll get that information. So it's like five, what's three more than five? And so then you have to watch kids. It, how it's a it. common trend. Yeah. And it's not unusual at all for families to come in with students who have been read to and they've, you know, they, mm -hmm. they, they interact with literacy at home a whole lot more than math. And that's not anybody's fault. Right. It's just a habit that tends to happen in families. Mm -hmm. yes. Then if you go to the next one, we look at grades one through five reading data. We're in administering this particular assessment is called the Fontes and Padel um, benchmark assessment. Um, and what it does is it tells the classroom teacher the student's independent level and their instructional reading level so that they can build their classroom libraries and determine which books the, stu the student needs to be at instructionally, which ones they need to be at independent. So I just gave you a snapshot of the range of our current third grade class. So if you imagine our third grade class across the district, and teachers meeting their needs, it's quite a range. If you go on to the next one, you're gonna see their proficiency for this particular assessment. So if you look at grade three, which is the one that we said by end of grade three, we'd like to, our students to be reading on grade level, we have a very low number there. We currently have in our fall administration, 44% of our students reading on grade level. However, those students what we witness is between spring and fall every year when we give this administration is we do have summer regression. This particular group, we have a large dip from 74% were proficient as second graders in the spring to 44% in the fall. I looked back over a course of three years and there was a pretty consistent regression over the summer. However, we did roll out this as a new assessment for about half of our district this year. And we bought the latest version of it and put a new training in place. So. I think there's a little bit of a bump there, but I'm eager to look at winter because typically we recover that regression by the winter administration. But this is how our students are doing on grade level right now um, in terms of grade one, two, three, four, and five. We've got some areas that saw much bigger regression than over the summer than others. So, I have a question. Yep. Um, so those individuals that are 25% behind oh um, yep. grade three but we pick on that one it's it so what what's going on with the 20 what is going to be done with the 25 kids who are not I mean, I, I reckon that we're not meeting grade three so you know in spring of 2018 which means now they're in grade four yep so grade three, grade three is interesting because we don't have any state data to look at. It's simply local assessment data up until that point. Mm -hmm. It isn't until the end of grade three that you'd look at an SBEC result. So what we do is we look at their, um, what they've been doing all along. We look at um, the third grade reading assessment data, but we go back and figure out was that student on grade level in grade two? If so, that's typically that's a summer of regression. If, if they not, mm -hmm. they've probably been identified already. So we build our MTSS groups, our, our list of students for whom we think they need extra literacy instruction, mm -hmm. usually in the spring. 
Then when we run the administration, we see, has something changed for this child? Has anybody else been kind of added to this list that we worry about? And then we start building intervention groups. We have readers workshop in the classroom, so the teachers have the ability to be able to get a, um, to be able to run mini lessons with groups of students that are particular levels to move them along. And then we run this assessment again in the winter to make sure that they're moving along. The benchmark does keep changing, so they we're not just trying mm -hmm. to get them to there, we wanna keep them moving along. Um, we also run systems called um, leveled literacy intervention groups. So there are um, specialists who will pull students after they've had literacy instruction in class, not instead of, mm -hmm. and then they provide intensive supports. And then we track those kids over time. So those are the systems okay. that we put in place okay. when we find them. Right. Um, but I did wanna make sure that you saw that there is some pretty significant summer regression, but they, it tends to pop back pretty quickly. We are hovering around 70% right now. So when we think about that measurable outcome of all students meeting by grade three, we've been hovering at about 70%. Some years we've been a little higher. Some cohorts have been a little higher. I think we had a cohort last year out of Summit that was closer to 90%. Brendan? Yeah. So doesn't, I mean, doesn't summer regression though have an impact on sort of the efficiency of instruction time, right? I mean, if you're spending the first few months of every academic year catching kids back up, isn't, I mean, is, it, is, there, is there nothing we can do to address summer regression other than changing our school calendar? <laughs> yes, and for an assessment, <laughs> did you say change the school calendar? Yes, he did say that. Um, and for an assessment like this, the summer regression, I just wanted to make sure to point that out when you saw the low numbers. Um, it's not as tragic as it sounds. Sometimes it's the early, it's those, just those reading behaviors. It's just getting them back into their reading behaviors again. Um, sometimes it's getting them back into their reading groups again and putting them with what we call the just right books. So maybe over the summer they were reading, but maybe they weren't challenging themselves in some way. In many ways that pops the number up pretty quickly. Because we run reading groups in our classes, they are designed to be able to bring a student where they are and move them to the next one. It's not a whole group kind of move. So it's not like there's 25% of the kids kind of sitting over there. Right. Um, having said that, things we can do in the summer, um, I know our schools have been fairly creative with this one. I know that um, over at Summit, I think they're on our second year in a row where the kids go home with bags and the bags have the books with different levels in it so that they can challenge themselves and they can come back and turn those in every two weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, so we do try to put place, things in place in the summer, and we run summer school for students who are identified. Um, there will naturally be some summer regression regardless, unless you change the calendar. Mm -hmm. and, and these are independent levels. Yes, right? they're reading really independently. Sure. Yes, so a student would be able to leave and be able to yeah. sit by themselves and read at this level. It's a fairly high benchmark to set because yes. we want these students to be able to read independently at a level that yeah. They'd be independent. Mm -hmm. Speaking as one of the two third grade parents in the room, yes. um, mm -hmm. isn't this like the smallest year in a long time? So, like when we look at data from Westford, you're going to see a lot more fluctuation. This in is the entire district. Of people, but like the third grade is like the the population oh, of our district cratered of around either the third grade or the second grade. Yeah, right. I'd have to look it up. I'm not sure. So we might be seeing bigger changes simply because it's a smaller number of people. Could be. Um, Could be. The blue bar, is that so like for the what third they grade, were, was it that 74% of them at the end of second grade were reading at second grade level? Mm -hmm. And then in the fall, 44% of them are reading at third grade level? Yes, yeah, so as second graders in the spring, and the benchmark is the same. It's June spring is the same benchmark as fall or is okay. September. Um, third grade intentionally, that's an, that's an so 74% of them met it in June okay. and then didn't in September. Yeah, I wasn't sure if it was like you step up the expectations, yep. that's, that's interesting. No. That's okay, thank you. Yep. So that's some reading data. I'll give you some math data. We uh, administered a common math assessment. Um, you're probably familiar with uh, the, the fact that we now have the Bridges Math Program in place in all of our schools. It, it's new over at Founders and Essex Elementary. It's no small feat to put a new math program in place. This is not something you just open up the textbook and go, this is a very robust math program with math stations and number corner. So our um, teachers over in Essex Elementary and Founders, are um, we've put a lot of training in place for that. And what we did is we, we um, pulled some tasks from that program and built, our math coaches built a common math assessment K through five. Just put it out there for fall to see what we could see. And we see that we are doing pretty well in oral and written counting. Um, operations, um, this is K through five commingled, by the way. 
place value and fractions are areas that we want to take a particular look at. Um, and fractions is not assessed at all grades, but it's definitely something that this is our first dip in to see how our students are doing. We'll give a similar assessment in the winter and in the spring. The idea being we're going to see groups of students to see if we see curriculum trends, but also so we can track a student over time to see are they making gains in fractions or are they making gains in place value. And I, I have to say that I sat with a principal the other day and looked at her math data and the power that Alpine has given us is just incredible. Like, it's so really Alpine unified. It's really done a nice amazing. job of unifying us, I think, yeah. around some common yeah. things. But it's very easy to use, too. So on to middle high school. We have a common reading assessment in place now, Star Reader. It is um, computer based. It's computer adaptive to a certain degree. Um, the high school's been administering it for ninth grade and 10th grade for the last few years. They were administering it three times a year. We're looking at backing down to maybe twice a year. Um, and the middle levels in com are, have been doing it in common. ADL's been doing it a little bit longer than EMS and ADL. So we can start to look at star reading data. Um, it produces something called the instructional reading level, and this is the mean score. So again, large groups of students for us to look at the fact that our mean score for instructional reading level for grade six is six, and for grade eight is nine is reassuring. Um, but what the real power is finding those students for whom that is not their instructional reading level and trying to figure out how to support them in a middle school or a high school setting. So the next graph shows you the students who are meeting benchmarks. So we have, it's, it's really interesting to look at from grades six through 10, we have a fairly common trend of about 72% of them, 75% of them on average in our class are meeting our state benchmarks based on this local assessment. Whereas anywhere from you know, 22 to 28, I think, are not. Those are significant numbers of students within a large system like ours. So when you move into a middle school and a high school and you have almost 30% of our students not necessarily meeting benchmarks in reading, that is an area of concern. Um, it's an area that our literacy coaches are meeting with the middle school principals around and the, um, one of our coaches is now attending our district-wide um, humanities PLC and they've identified um, reading and writing as something that they want additional supports and additional professional learning for. It does get harder and harder for adolescents, obviously. The harder, the, the, the greater gap when they move into, into middle school, it's harder to want to leave and work with a literacy specialist. So have to be pretty creative to support adolescents who are struggling in reading. And uh, math. I'm oh, sorry. Sure. Are the questions on Star Reader supposed to be the same every time you take it? I guess like, cause like when I take it, it's like the same questions. Like it feels like it feels like the question bank is like very limited. So like if you're asking like a person the same question and like they kind of feel like they answered it right the like the previous time, like they're gonna answer the same thing. So like maybe like you need more questions to assess whether or not they actually are reading like on level. And I know like the data probably doesn't really support that because it seems like it's level. It's like very consistent overall, but that's just like a small thing that I yeah. I always think about whenever I take it. Yeah, we and we have definitely received feedback by the, from the ninth and tenth graders like enough already. Okay, I've taken this, um, and I'm seeing some of the same questions over and over again. It adjusts. It, it adjusts, but it, it you're right. It has a, it has a certain bank, yeah. and if you are in a particular span of reading, it's probably hitting some of the same the same questions. It's one of the reasons why we look at it as one data point, and we look at it against SBAC, or we look at it against what's going on in the classroom. Um, and we absolutely see big up and downs at the high school. Like clearly there are kiddos who have met a level in fall and by winter, I'm wondering if they really cared a whole lot about that assessment because suddenly it took a deep and then it went back up again. Absolutely, um, it's not, I think, a favorite thing for adolescents to sit and take a reading assessment on a computer. Hmm. Um, it will be interesting this year to be able to look at those scores against, because we now have numbers of years against how students perform on ACT, because that is something that they care a little bit more about. See if there's some correlation there. So like, is the test bank thing gonna like, just kind of say it's the same, or like? I'm sorry, say it again? I guess like, maybe like, is the test bank thing gonna be expanded? Like, do you know if SBAC, was, you, or, or not SBAC, but STAR, like? STAR, I don't know, you know, it's from a different vendor. We didn't create it. It's, um, I'm happy to reach out and find out if it's okay. gonna be expanded. It's interesting to hear your reaction to that. I, I think I saw similar reactions during the pilot. I don't know if you took the, if you were in grade 11, the pilot um, science assessment. 
Yeah, I, I took that too, yeah. Yeah, some of the same items as I walked around and watching students take them. They, I'm wondering how many they're going to come up with. No. So it's not an adaptive. It's adaptive by reading level, but I think it does grow, it, it draws from a bank. So if you're oh. given a particular um, so task. They don't give you a new edition of the test. They, they're supposed to be, but it, you, if you're working within the same span, they may be grabbing the same sort of tasks. Yeah, I know I'll look into thing, it. Like, I would say like 90% of the questions are repeats. Like it's a very, very high percentage, like with very mm -hmm. little variety. So that's good to test. know. Thank yeah. you for thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah, does she really know this? <laughs> and then the last, I think, data point I'm going to share with you is we have a common math assessment, Star Math, that's relatively new to us. Um, and what we're seeing is, um, you know, we've struggled, gosh, statewide, nationally, to have really good middle-level math assessments. Um, it's it's just always been a struggle for us. So we've tried this one out to see how you know see how our students reacted to it in some way, um, and we find that our students are doing, you know, the, they're they're state meeting the state proficiency in this particular sixth grade cohort. It was not so great, and then uh, seventh grade was a little bit better, and eighth grade was a little bit better. What we're doing though is we're sitting with the teachers and looking at um, the rosters of students, how they're performing on this assessment, and saying, "Do you see that in the classroom? <coughs> are, there, are there particular things that you're seeing in there?" Because we're still kind of testing the test on this one. But the numbers are not entirely different than the ones that we're seeing from SBEC. They are lower than, just like ELA is higher for SBEC for us than math. Um, we're seeing the same thing for this. So then I was looking at trying to find ways to back to Patrick's question. We identified specific measurable outcomes. Now that we have all of this data, um, what are the points that we can kind of grab to, to try to answer some of these questions as a system? Some are easier than others. So I put them in that, sort of categorize them in that way. Every student will read by grade level end of grade three. Will we have an assessment that we have in common right now? It measures independent level. That one we're feeling pretty solid about. Every student, so we could use that. Um, we could also use SBAC. So those are two data points that we could use to measure our outcomes on that. Every student would demonstrate proficiency in whole numbers by the end of grade four. We're testing out our local <coughs> assessment, and we do have math. <coughs> so those, I think, are the two that we could start with to look at to see if we can answer those questions over time. Now, the next ones are a little bit harder. Every student develops transferable skills across content areas. You know, the, the, way, the way we ended up writing it, and I'll confess I probably was the one that wrote it, we didn't say they were exhibiting them. We said that they would be, that they developed them in some way. So we do have the Vermont transferable skills. We've actually, we're gonna be including two of them on the K through five progress report. So teachers are start res responding out to them. We have had other kinds of transferable skills on report cards and progress reports in the past, but we haven't had them in common. And the high school's been doing some work around trying to figure out how do you teach to and assess things like problem solving, like in a broad way or um, being an, a critical and informed thinker. So that's an area that I would describe as in progress. Um, but that's one area that we could reach into is reporting on the Vermont transferable skills. I think that we could probably find some other areas as well. Each student is physically active and has access to healthy food. Well, we have a new PE assessment we could look at at certain uh, stages, having access to healthy food choices. It's interesting that we mix those together in a kind of challenge to try to figure out outside of what we serve in our schools, how would we, how we, how would we get that information? Um, why RBS results sometimes have that as a question? It might be helpful. We can also look at our, um, the data that we collect around what we're serving and if it's meeting, mm -hmm. you know, federal guidelines. Who's choosing it? Yep, who's choosing yep. it? Yep. And the food service um, managers are meeting with students to get their feedback. So. That might be helpful. That's, like, Some of these may result in reaching out to students and actually uh -huh. collecting information right. about this. Yeah. All students having a meaningful personalized learning plan. Well, we could measure how many have PLPs. The, when we put the word meaningful, we meant it. Um, how would we measure that they find meaning in it? I think that's, again, reaching out to students to find out, and we're relatively new to this as a process. Every student would graduate with the skills to be successful in college and further said that was a big one. That was aspirational right there. Um, we are in a process where the Vermont Agency of Education, as part of our new school accountability system, is reaching out and collecting 
college and career ready data points. So some examples are numbers of students who've taken uh, AP exams and gotten a 345, uh, numbers of students who take dual enrollment, um, students who head off to post-secondary and stay beyond one year. I don't know how they're collecting this data, but I know that it's gonna be part of our accountability system and I think that that would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. It may be an area that we, we may wanna talk about collecting in information about that. Um, you know, it's more that, I read this as more than they met the graduation expectations. And then the last one I'm most challenged with, quite frankly, so I made it green. <laughs> student voice and students experiencing a culture of independence, responsibility, and accountability. These are um, really challenging to measure. So some ideas that I put down there. We are gonna be um, receiving a new pilot. Um, we're in pilot a lot. Um, the AOA is giving us a pilot school, say, um, school climate survey that certain students will be responding to, grades five, six, seven, and 10, and all of our teachers will be taking. We haven't heard anything else about it. Um, and I know that this, this may touch on some of those domains. Again, YRBS data may be able to help, but this may be an area where we need to think about going directly to our students. Yes, I agree. I think it's a lot of anecdotal also in collecting information from our leaders, our principals, and opportunities that they provide. For students, our student reps will be tackling student voice and finding out how many opportunities to. So they're going to do some of that work. Huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I think to your book read, I think, I think what's available and then who's accessing them. Yeah. You know, do we have equitable right. access for right. those opportunities? Absolutely. But why are the next? Sorry, youth risk behavior survey. Oh. Um, it's administered by the state. It's been inconsistent from year to year about when we get those reports. Thank you. So they asked about, did you know how to get these things? At YRBS? No, but they, sometimes they have questions around sense of belonging, sense of safety, yeah, um, whether or not you feel like you have, um, I don't know if they say the word voice, but, the, but uh, positive relationships in your school, those kinds of things. Some yeah. of those questions That's might be helpful. Right. So right. Do they feel safe? Do they feel safe? These are the ones that also ask about marijuana use. And, and yeah. 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 Okay. So that was a dab of assessment data. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Assume you're going to come back to right you, here. You always threaten to bring me back. <laughs> you get busy. But I'm happy to come back. We have you on the calendar. My what? And then Patrick. Got a question because we've got student reps on the board. Years ago when my son was in school, the biggest complaint I heard all the time was always around phys ed or food. And he was never happy, no matter what school he was in with the food. Is that changed? Have you seen a change over the years being in school with the quality of food? I'd say like not really I don't know I mean like maybe variety yes like I feel like when I was like in elementary school it was very much like chicken nuggets and then when you move up like obviously they add more food but I would say like because some of the food that they make you can use the same product but like make it in different forms like different sauces or stuff so I feel like overall like the health level probably is not very good um yeah I feel like that's where we could like improve on maybe like healthier food I don't know yeah, I, I think there's a lot of like chicken products in our school that is like the, the breaded chicken, like that is used a lot. Like you can use that for like chicken patties, chicken tenders, um, you can use it for like the buffalo chicken tenders. I don't know, it's just like there's a lot of uses for that. But you do have a salad bar option yes. all the time. Yeah, I don't know if like that's like utilized like a lot. <laughs> it's there though for a healthy choice right. at all our schools now. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know if like students like take the initiative to like right. do that. Right. Yeah. Um so last year I had asked, um, and it was a year ago, so I'm not uh it's not on here, but I was wondering if I could get it again. I was curious about looking at the numbers for those cohorts that advanced through the grade levels, um, the number of students that remained in district, because I know that we see those coming in and going out 
and I had been wondering whether or not we were able to filter out those who come in to look at those students who have remained in district through three, four, five, six, just so that we could get an idea of those students who are in district only representing the learning that we provide, whether or not that's a higher number or you know if our numbers are indeed getting lower because we have kids coming in from Winooski or Burlington or anything. So yeah, out of state. So I realize that it's probably not anything that you have readily available, but I would really like to see if there's any way yeah, that we can I, get I those numbers. Because I'm trying to figure out how to get it, yeah. but, I, yeah. but, but it's an interesting question. I used to be able to get it out of a state data system that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, um, I mean, it just let me, seems... Let me play around with it. it. And now that we've merged, that might make it a little bit harder to follow. I do know that, I mean, we do have about a 30% transition in and out. Yeah, it just seems like it would be really important to me if, you know, we're, if everyone who's in our district is hovering more like 80% than at 64%, then I'm going to feel much more secure about what we're doing, knowing that, okay, maybe, you know, students coming in from out of state are bringing those levels down. Or just oh, students who experience a lot yeah. of transitions. Let me see if I can but there are figure out how to get students, to that. And we still have to provide Yeah, I realize that <laughs> and that we are absolutely going to be, you know, held accountable yeah. for that. But it was more just a curiosity of, you know, what we're doing, is it working? relevant to um, Patrick's suggestion, which I'm really interested in too, because um, that's like eliminating a lot of independent variables. Um, is it possible to just ask it to only give you information for people for whom there are X number of years of data? Because that would yeah. give you mm -hmm. only people who had been in the system for all the years that you were looking for. If I limited it just to SVAC, it would be four years. Yep. Yeah, I do know our highest transition seems to be in the K-3 range. So that might limit us. It might have to be 4 or 5. Let me play around with it. Diane. Okay, my, my question is, I guess, a different tact. Um, we, we always talk about who's not meeting expectations. How about the kids that are exceeding expectations? What are we doing for those kids that come into kindergarten and are already reading at grade 2? Or are those kids that are in grade 3 that are reading at grade 6? Or, or, or doing wonderful things like moving from, um, I remember kids used to move from ADL to the high school because they were exceeding um, expectations at ADL. I, I'm not familiar with EMS, I wish I was. But what are, what are we doing, you know, the testing would do tell us that they're exceeding expectations. What are we doing to continue to keep them challenged? I mean, I can't tell you what happens with every student. I know that by putting a reader's workshop model in a classroom, and we're not there yet, and I think in terms of them being, you know, um, up and fully functioning in all classrooms, by doing it, that design allows for every student to be able to be read and um, to read and be challenged at their grades, at their level. Mm -hmm. By putting a math program in place that has math workstations based on where a students at and where they're supposed to be going, it gives that opportunity for us to be able to create those environments. Outside of that, I think about some examples. We've, we have had students who um, have, we've had meetings, um, a Fleming principal and an and a ADL principal would sit with me and say, I've got the student who is, shh, they're going. You know, can we mm. find something in place to be able to support them? We've looked at online opportunities. We provide things like the John Hopkins courses. We've worked mm -hmm. with um, uh, Vermont Virtual to provide some mm -hmm. online courses. And in some cases, we have had students not necessarily go up a grade level, but maybe go up for math or something like that to meet their needs. We do try to keep students at their developmental level because there's a lot of research that if you bump up somebody right. too fast, their academics may yeah, be there, about their maturity may not be. Also. So I don't have a quick answer for you. Those are some of the things that I often get pulled in on individual cases. Okay. Uh, I, I'm just asking for the, the possibilities of keeping mm -hmm. our kids challenged. Yeah. At, um, and at the upper level, a lot of our students have been accessing dual enrollment courses. So having well, that state provide that support has been really helpful. Right. Well, when they get to that college level, it's, it's, it's getting them to here, and then, mm -hmm. yes, they go there, but it's how we keep them challenged in our system because we're not going to have an ADL student or an EMS student going to UVM. Well, we might, I mean, but 
the, the, the challenge and the rarity of that is probably rare. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more kids being probably one or two grades uh, beyond peers in, in a special subject, math and reading seem to be the popular too. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it sounds like we're doing or algebra some seminar. things that lend themselves to challenging students. Threatening. Two questions. Uh, just to go back to that other point about segmentation of data. You know, I think um, yes, they are all our kids now. But if you're able to identify a group of kids that is having a particular challenge and they all share a common trait, like they might all be newer, newer to the district, it's a way for you to sort of identify and specify an intervention for those kids to help get them up to speed. Um, the second question I have is, um, or point is, um, are you able to, in a um, cooperative way, <laughs> have um, principals and district, uh, principals and teachers from ADL and EMS sit together with their data and say, boy, you're really having success in this area. Teach us what, you know, sh show us the way, you know, or you're, se you're really seem to be having uh, a, a great experience in math, you know, help us understand how you're making that. Po Is that kind of communication that happened? The first time ever systemically, yes. <laughs> okay. So once a month on Tuesdays, we have our district collaborative days. So our Essex Middle School and ADL and Westford Middle Level math teachers all meet together in a PLC, and we have a PLC leader meeting them or uh, facilitating them, a teacher mm -hmm. leader, and we have an administrator assigned K through eight. Each of our grade levels or at the middle level, it's content area, we have an administrator assigned to them to help them through that conversation. And we're using the PLC format and the uh, Rick DeForce three questions. What is it that we want students to know? How do we know that they're knowing it? How do we meet their needs if they're meeting it or not? Right. And so that framework is cause for that conversation. Great. We've only had two so far, right. September <laughs> and October. But they're, you know, I, I think that it's, been, it's an exciting opportunity for us to do that, particularly for schools who only have one or two teachers. They haven't right. had a chance to really talk to somebody else. Great. Great. Okay, I, I have two questions, I guess. The first one is, like when you get the scores back, can you see maybe like by like classroom, like what the average score is? Cause like maybe some teachers are doing something that's right and like mm -hmm. we want everyone to like follow that. I don't know. So do you have that kind of data? Yes, okay. Okay, yeah, and then, we do. Okay. Um, depending on how we set it up, you, you're talking about state data or any any data? Um, any, but I was saying like breaking it down by classroom, like yeah. We can. Um, yeah, and we do, and the principals okay. get reports in terms of which teachers have. And it's helpful, too, because it, it may not necessarily be what's going on in the classroom so much as there's a particular cohort of students that we need to pay particular attention to. Okay, and also, I guess, um, like, with the math thing, like, do you see any changes in, like, curriculum or something maybe to, like, help with that? Because I know when I was in, like, a long time ago, like, in, like, elementary school, like, I feel like there are some foundational math things that weren't really emphasized, like, um like multiplication table like i feel like we like we always had access to the multiplication table but when you get older you're expected to memorize it and there was never that explicit like you need to maybe just like know what six times seven is like right off the bat yeah at k5 we just overhauled the math program so we used to use something called everyday math and we um in essex town i think had um, elements of investigations and both systems have gone to a system called bridges which is pretty well respected that is built on math common core so hopefully we'll see some improvements in that area um, middle level, um, I think there's a need for us, as Brendan talked about, the um, sharing of practices across the middle level. We do have some program elements that are in common here and there. Um, they're working on the idea of having a common math and science assessment that they would give locally to try to figure out what are the gaps that our students are meeting. Okay. I'm going to give Al the last question. If I can, um, I'm just really concerned about what we have to cover tonight. So I would ask if you have further questions to send them to me, and I'll send out the questions and Amy's responses to the whole board. So, um, Thank you. The first question, if I was sitting here five years ago and we were talking about students' proficiency level by thirds, and those that are just missing the cut. Same conversation five years ago. Mm -hmm. So, 
have you thought about doing anything different in the classroom to help those groups move to that next level? Uh, and the second part of that question has to do with area schools. And does that trend follow other area schools in our region? So, and I think I wrote this, but I don't think I said this. Um, I was not able to get you how we did, because I know we talked about this this time last year. <coughs> how, do, how do we do against CBU? How do we do against South Burlington? When that's public, I can get that to you. It's not public yet, so I can't share it. This is, I have access to our state assessment scores and I can break it into thirds. I don't have access to the other schools, so I don't know if they're breaking it into thirds. I would agree with you. It's a common trend for us to look at those, sort of that almost. Yeah. What we're doing in the classroom is around curriculum and around designing local assessments to try to figure out what are our students able to do and kind of move them there. One of the challenges and one of the reasons that we're sitting here maybe five years from now is this is actually a different assessment than when we had that conversation five right. years ago. Right. And it is a common trend of those like the almost. Um, SPEC does not release tasks. NECAP used to release tasks so we could actually see particular tasks that kids didn't do well on and say, ah, oh, that's the thing. SPEC doesn't release them. So that's, that's oh. a little frustrating for us. Mm. So we do find ourselves guessing a little bit. I also would say that in the past five years, moving to the workshop model mm -hmm. in language arts, and so that it's, pr it's consistent through the elementary schools, and also the workshop model that bridges in mathematics allows, which gets to, yes. Okay. Yeah, that independent level and working and being able to do that, where I have always felt for a very long time, is that we as teachers try to hold kids' hands and not give them enough independent time. And the workshop model makes that happen, that independent time. Okay. So when kids were left to a test, it was like, oh, I can't do this. Okay. I'm all by myself. You know, so. Okay, the second part had to do with the first common assessment plan. So it's going out twice during the school year to families. At K-5, we're sending out progress reports or report cards twice a year, and we're sending out these assessment reports I would, um, three times a year. I would assume that there are a number of families that are online and that they get this data online? No, Alpine uh, as a data system does not have a portal. So at the K-5, and, and we, we're intentional about making sure that when we have assessment information that it's within a conversation. So we have it produced for the parent conference oh, okay. so the teachers can sit. Because having a parent log on and see my child is derivational, it, it requires a conversation to explain what it is. Okay. So that's why we're sending them out in parent conferences in October. And then we're going to send them out again just before parent conferences. Um, okay. after the second All window right. and then it'll be by then parents will have a better understanding and it'll squat yeah, that's an important point the last point i would like to make is i see personalized learning plans as a tool to engage students in their learning and and uh, i have been in listening to the prior discussion i've been very concerned that the learning plans and accountability for those learning plans uh, being fully understood and implemented by students, the sooner the better. Mm -hmm. And that that is a tool to help all students with a direction, putting a direction in their lives and mm -hmm. some goals out there. So the piece I see missing is the accountability piece and how we close the loop because it looks like it's too early a plan. I just wanted you to hear that feedback, but uh, I'm concerned about it. Thank you. Do you mean close the gap as opposed to closing? Yeah, that, that, that all students have had the opportunity to fully understand the importance, time to actually complete it, understand the bulbs, uh, well, we're just starting. Just starting. But it's important that we have a closed loop system here and that I students are this. actually doing this because I see it as related to engage their engagement in their own learning process. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm back in April. Yeah. Unless you need me earlier. Okay. To think about.
and we can access um, quite a few things online, right? So, okay, great. Let's move on to the student transportation plan update. So again, we organize these in wins, action items, challenges, threats, and then some other information. So as we look for some wins, I'm just going to highlight some points through it and not read it to you. But um, the modifications for Essex Elementary, Founders, Essex Middle School, and Essex High School town routes, that's happened um, on October 4th. We had a few calls come through about um, checking. Some of them were, they didn't know the change happened. Um, I just feel like no matter how much you communicate, it just, there's always some people that just are like, what? Um, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, anyways. Um, so we did give information and you received it also about um, the implementation for a Hiawatha Summit Fleming and ADL. So we're gathering um, through a survey, alternate site and opt out information. Also a Google map um, powered page on the Essex Westford School District website identifies the walkout zones um, for Hiawatha Summit Fleming and ADL when we do implement the transportation. They, um, we continue to have recruitment efforts um, through Essex Westford School District and they still continue, <coughs> excuse me, to yield applicants. Um, interesting enough, Facebook has been for other things too, not just for transportation, but crossing guards we've received. Um, we were, Ben and I were talking the other day, he has some numbers in my next student report, I mean my superintendent report, I'll bring you the numbers and how much Facebook is yielding for app, it's like phenomenal, it's so cool. Never thought that would happen. So interesting. Um, Mountain Transit has a current um, driver who's been around for a while and they will be a driver trainer which is really an improvement if there'll be an on-site um, driver that's that's pretty cool or a trainer some action items we need to analyze the um, responses that we received from Hiawatha Fleming Summit and ADL um, I didn't check that number today but on Friday we were up to about 250 I haven't checked it since um, I've been busy doing other things. And then, um, so then once those are analyzed and looked at, then we'll build and refine those, not we. Jamie <laughs> will build and refine those roots. Special Ed, it gives us an opportunity now with the roots through those schools to look at Special Ed and how we can be more efficient with those. So that's something that we're discussing and looking at. Um, we know that we want to bring all school principals together to talk about behave and the behavior management specials and admin assistance to share protocols from what they've had in the town for behavior um, things, what they've done, and just procedures for leaving and um, you know exiting and entering schools from the bus and all that. So we'll have some opportunities for collaboration on around that. Um, there's been progress. Um, for the electrical upgrade to the garage for the cold winter months, and then expanding upon that. There's the construction of the shelter um, on the, down here on Educational Drive, so um, that's happening. Um, in the very early planning process um, for public meetings and community events at the schools to help understand rules on the bus and um, accessing that and the expectations. So, and also really looking at um, integrating the drivers into the building the process or the, um, yeah, for drafting bus rules and things like that to integrate and bring the drivers in, which I think is really important. And then new driver um, training sessions will be happening as we implement in EJ. Um, they're doing dry runs and um, looking at different ways to arrange students in seating 
um, seating arrangements and things. So some challenge is um, trying to be more proactive approach by putting some bus aids and monitor or monitors um, on the buses to be able to create the environment that continues what we do in our schools for character um, and behavior modeling. So I think that's really important in thinking about that. We have a, we're have we so apt to be reactive. I don't think I've ever been in a system with buses that has is proactive in thinking about that. And I think it's really important, and especially if we start in the younger grades and really get that up through. Um, it's almost like bringing a responsive classroom onto a bus. And then um, I know that Jamie's been finding it difficult. It, it, Yes, we have a transportation manager, but he's like a one single department by himself. So when he's trying to work on long-term goals, day-to-day -day things come up. I don't know how many times he rides a bus or is answering the phone call. I talked to him three different times today on different things that people were contacting me about. So I mean, and that does, I know as a superintendent or any administrator, you have your to-do list and you rarely get to your to-do list because of things are coming up. So that's the life in education too. So <laughs> I think we just have to have them adjust to that, but it is, you do have to have time for long-term goals also. Um, and then we, we know that the vehicles that we do own for our special ed buses and CTE that they're getting um, older. We need to do an evaluation on them and then develop a replacement plan. We know that we need to work on that. Driver status is a little disappointing. We had two drivers pass the CDL, which is awesome. One, as I told you before in the last report, is uh, filling in for a retired um, driver that we had come out to help us to start the school year. And the other one, we just had a bus driver give a notice, so our second driver needs to go fill that bus. So we're down to ground zero, and we need four drivers to implement service in Hiawatha Summit and Fleming. Um, some of the threats are the Colchester Island bus arrangement still is pretty iffy. I, um, it's going along okay. I'm waiting for the day that we have parents from Colchester report out to the superintendent as they were in the beginning that the, it's too long or something's happening. I know that we've shortened that route or Mountain Transit has really tried to shorten that route, but it still is like on the edge there. I feel like it's a fine line with what happens with that and we're also so if we do end up doing that at some point with we we know we can do that in one bus and we'll also help with the two ADL students that are traveling um, back home in a in a bus you know many, I mean in a van you know how many students we're talking about on that one? I don't I don't know that exact number no I'm sorry I don't know that ridership but I knew I do know that it used to be two bus up uh, two buses so if it could, that would be good. Um, then other information to think about is that Grand Isle Middle School, I think that you know, is closing its doors. So they're looking for choice schools. So Jamie wants to be proactive too and start thinking about do we provide transportation to those middle school students to bring in the tuition to bring them to Essex. Um, high school. So that's something, and I think probably the Transportation Committee too can think about that too. <laughs> but that's definitely on the radar. Questions? No. First, uh, in terms of the replacement age, I would include seriously uh, Westford as well. The what age? I'm sorry. I don't know. No, but this is a buses. This is what we, we buses own. we own. Yeah, okay. I can't go into yeah. Vendors. We own. Some of the vendor the buses are us. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And okay. Second. Well, I think there are some threats out there that aren't listed after uh, we took a long discussion, and maybe we'll talk about those a little later. Other questions or comments? So how many, do you know how many drivers are in process now? 
it sounds like everybody who was in process we have, is eaten up or gone. Right, the ones that were in the beginning of October. So in the last report, I can't remember the exact number, but we had some going through the middle of October and the end of October. That's how we were end up right. getting with, um, I don't have that last report in front of me. But I think there were four, four in the pipeline, and if two got their CDLs, there would be, would be two, two remaining. Right. Right. You know, discounting any potential leads that yeah. Ben may have. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Are there questions or comments? I just, not really a question. It's just uh, with this situation that we have, it's my ears are open to every time where I see an ad for other companies looking yeah, for drivers. Know. There are tons of them. And they offer a higher amount to get the driver in the doors. So once you get them trained, I expect you lo we lose our drivers once they get their CDLs. I can, because there's quite a bit of incentive money out there. Well, we pay a bonus, right? Yes, there is. There's a, um, a bonus for signing on, and then we did increase the hourly wage. A little wage. smaller than what, uh, what yeah. other companies. Well, yeah. Quite a bit smaller. Yeah. Maybe we could add a retention bonus, stay six months. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's one of the issues is there's got to be an incentive to stay. <laughs> so there were five in the pipeline, and out of that we were saying two or three most likely would get through that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I was um, I went to Mississippi last weekend to visit my son. <laughs> we were driving from the airport port in Birmingham, Alabama, to Starkville, and there was this huge sign about CDL drivers. My husband swerved over. Like, Do you want to take a picture? <laughs> no. <laughs> How are we thinking about The sign was the like CDL. as big as two tables. <laughs> so since the message here seems to be that um, since the meeting two weeks ago, we are zero steps closer to busing for Essex Junction in terms of drivers, um, I guess I have two questions. One is kind of a hypothetical thought experiment question. And the other is a more pragmatic question. The thought experiment question would be, let's say we get to the point where we have those four drivers, we implement service for K through five in the junction, and then three weeks later, a driver gives notice. We have no drivers in the pipeline. We have one less driver than we want to have. Where do we reduce service? Because that's kind of what we're automatically doing here is we're always reducing service in the junction is always our choice because we haven't yet implemented it. It's always on the chopping block. Um, the more pragmatic question would be when we looked like we had to not offer service to the high school, we scrambled everything to try to find a way to get people driving vans to make it happen. If we're not making any progress towards CDL drivers, is there something we could do to offer that same consideration to Essex Junction that we were going to offer to the high school. I know we didn't make a lot of progress finding people for vans, but nobody in the junction could drive those vans because we were driving our own kids. So it might be time to see if there was a different result if we explored that as a solution in the junction. The suggestion I was thinking about, uh, we've gone through a lot of discussion but I think uh, the school hiring its own drivers with uh, a different incentive, and maybe they wouldn't, if they, if they took a higher salary and didn't drive, we need to somehow focus on this backup system for the drivers. That seems to be a core issue. And I don't know for new drivers if it would take uh, a higher salary or a better benefit or whatever but if, if it was a long term if it was a longer term arrangement and a commitment with the contract maybe there's an incentive there to start to build that capacity and and I'd like to hear something from the administration 
prior to the budget process. At least to be thinking about that, not in the short term, but in a longer term, because that seems to be one of the core issues. So I'm curious why you think having us hire the drivers would make a difference when everybody's having trouble finding drivers. Right, because being the best thing which we don't really want to happen. Uh, but the thing that will really change this is if unemployment starts to rise again. Mm -hmm. Right. Which but is as long as unemployment is as low as it is right now, it's going to be tough. It looks no to matter me. what you do. Looks, mm -hmm. yeah. It looks to me like it's going to be low for, for a while. Mm -hmm. The economy is mm -hmm. improving and uh, this looks like a longer term process, but if you have a, an individual that's willing to sign up for a three or four or five year contract, that's that's different. So you might be able to offer a five year package. But no, but, but you can never hold people to that. Well, that's so. true, but contracts are maybe a, a way out. Huh. Grace. Okay, I guess I'd like to clarify, like we definitely can't like increase like the wages a little more like we definitely can't do that because like not in our budget or, or something or like just an option that we don't want to pursue so we already increased them quite a bit um yeah at some point you'd be past what you've budgeted okay yeah. just like checking in okay yeah. it's the crux of the problem still comes down to the nature of the job it's only at most four five hours a day mm -hmm. And those that migrate out with a CDL, they're migrating into uh, full-time positions. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, I'm not sure how we can change that, but generally it used to be combination school employee plus bus driver. So maybe start looking in those terms. Yeah, with, and, and I'm sure you are. But we explored that. Last spring, and right. that didn't work. Um, but these I, are employees that are already in place, so maybe right. as, uh, as attrition occurs, is mm -hmm. half yeah. day this, half day that. Um, is it, I, but I think we should be careful. I think we've only trained one person that left for something else, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's not, a, it's it's not a huge piece of what's going on here. The other thought, uh, if I could share as well, is with consolidation is becoming the issue. Um, at some point, there's going to be less and less tuition, uh, tuition in kids because I think the islands are in flux right now as to what they're going to do. And no, they're while Grand Isle is eliminated, um, they're seven eight in the process, South Heroes hanging on, but at some point in time, um, the Department of Ed is going to come down and start talking about what's going to happen to the ones that I have not consolidated. Yeah, I think South Hero has been given a pass. Okay. So in the statewide plan, some school districts were given a pass, and I think South Hero is one of them. And Grand Isle is eliminating 7A because they merged with other schools that are K through 6. Right. Okay. Are we ready to leave the update and move on to the policy? Talk some more. Uh, Let's talk some more about transportation. Right. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm representing. Uh, the transportation subcommittee, which includes Al, Keeley, Patrick, and myself. Um, just to let you know kind of the work that we've been doing, we've been meeting just about weekly um, since we've been formed. We've had, we've had three meetings so far. Uh, the work that we've done includes a review of local area policies, other transportation policies. We've also collected some relevant relevant information. We've had, we had a lot of questions for the administration that um, – uh, that helped and um, looked at things like bus contracts that are in place. Um, and we also, at the last meeting, which I, I missed, um, we also got some input from Brian uh, and Jamie um, on just, just to hear them out in terms of 
you know, what are the things that they might find helpful in a policy? Um, so that's where things currently stand in terms of the work that we've done. And can we go to the next slide? So the, so the timeline that we've proposed and that we intend to meet is that um, tonight we are here to check in with the board. Um, we have developed um, sort of two lines of thinking that um, one having to do with um, service level and one having to do with contingencies that we want to get some input from the board. We don't want a decision. We don't need you to, to decide anything, but we definitely would like to hear your feedback and input on, on a couple of questions that we'll put in front of you. That input, um, along with other feedback that we've gotten, uh, we've received from the administration will help to shape the draft of the policy that we plan on working um, in the coming week. So we're gonna draft uh, a new policy and uh, try to get it through some kind of initial legal review uh, through our general counsel because we wanna make sure that we're walking a fine line there. Um, we expect to have a first reading of the full policy on November 6th and then to come back for the second and final reading, hopefully adoption for November 20th. That is our time frame that we're looking at. Any questions about either the work to date or the plan. Okay. Based on the conversation we just had, <laughs> um, you know, what's sobering for us as a committee, I think, is the fact that um, we could craft the best transportation policy you've ever seen, um, but it all comes down to drivers. And so um, I want people to have the expectation that a policy and some recommendations that we may make as a committee to the administration um, can be helpful, but it is not going to be any sort of magic potion or silver bullet. Uh, I think we just need to sort of get our expectations aligned around that. Um, I think it can help move us in the right direction, but it's not gonna necessarily solve all of our problems. So we have two questions for you tonight, and I'm hoping that somebody from the transportation subcommittee could take extra close notes on what you hear um, in terms of feedback. So the first question we have for you and, and what we would love to get your input on is a question about priority. Um, one of the things we've been talking a lot about is and trying to help the administration navigate is um, rather than you know just create the best and biggest and most complete system, um, it would be helpful to know from the board's perspective uh, from your personal perspective as well as, as maybe representing um, folks in your community, um, how would you rank these following items in terms of their level of importance? So number one, expanding service to Essex Junction, something we've talked a lot about. The second one is maintaining the expectation of service levels by town and history, so thinking about the system that we had for Essex Town and the High School that we have worked so hard to sort of put back together this year. The third is transportation of tuition students, which we talked a little bit about just now. How important is extracurricular transportation for sporting events, clubs, field trips, etc.? And and then are there other things that we that are not on this list that you think should be? So it would be great just to go around and to get your thoughts in terms of like what are the top three in your mind uh, on this list of things that are um, the most important as we continue this work around the policy. Marla? I would not be able to give you an answer tonight and it's because I would need to know how much the tuition students bring in in income how it would impact CTE if we didn't bus tuition students. Okay. Um, I need that detail because that income impact from tuition from my memory of years ago when I was involved with that board, mm -hmm. it's a high amount and we would be pressed as a district to make that money up. Yeah. Can I comment? Um, I think the tuition students on the bus with Colchester and the bus from Georgia, that's separate from CTE, it's correct? It's not CTE, that there. So those are yeah. two separate issues? 
Okay, yeah. but it does impact the kids that High come school. here and they yeah. can go over to That's CTE, right. correct? Yes. Well, Once no. Here. No, the CTE has their own transportation. Either the district, their own district, sends the students, or we have a few buses from CTE that go out and get students. But it doesn't, have, it doesn't affect here what happens at Essex High School. Essex High School that come here go over to CTE. This tuition students, I think what they're talking about, wouldn't affect CTE. So right. do we have the income, the amount of income they bring in and the cost of I transporting? I think it's about 600000 I think. I, I, uh, I think the other important point you made this fall, I think, and was 600000 okay. The other important point you made this fall to consider, and I don't know what this looks like, but are those students impacting the ability to offer certain courses? Because if you don't have X number of students, you can't mm -hmm. offer that's the true. course. And so that's another piece of data that I think we have to consider. Because if those students go away, mm -hmm. do we lose no courses? Do we lose five courses? Right. Do we lose yeah. 15 yeah. courses? Um, so those, so those, those, are, those are great data points that we'll try to get working uh, with Brian or Beth to get that information. And, and keep in mind that the, ex the exercise that we're doing right now is not, we're not asking you to choose one over another. We're just trying to get a sense of, in terms of the level of importance to you, and I understand data is a key part of, the, of that thinking, but in terms of what you feel is a priority in this list, what, what's the number one priority for you as a board member in terms of what's the most important on this list? Okay, so we have another question down there, question. I would rate that I wanna get the youngest students to school priority. Okay. And that question isn't up there. Okay. So I think we need to look at age groups. Okay. Distance from schools, which. So, so the second question that we have, we'll get into a little bit of that. But okay. That's, but that's. that's and um, I can honestly tell you from my perspective that if we're in a busing crunch to get kids to school, extra, extracurricular transportation should not be involved in the equation. Because the important thing is to get the kids here for their day, for their schooling and education. So uh, I have a question about where, why that's up there. Because I understood that the folks who try for extracurricular are, is a totally different group of people and don't really affect whether we have Dress drivers for the school day. So if I thought that that did affect how many drivers we had to get kids to and from school, yeah. that would be fine. But I understood Brian to say early on that taking away that transportation isn't gonna help us with our to and from yeah. school transportation. It's it, it's not directly impactful, but it is in a way, only insofar as the extracurricular transport, it gets paid at a higher rate. Um, so there's a different set of individuals who will usually do that. Those individuals could theoretically and do sometimes get used if there's a bus driver on a regular route who's out and sick, they will pull from that pool. So if we do need to do that, that person's then no longer available for extracurricular transport that day because they're running a regular route. So there is some connection here, and I think it's important to bear in mind that this priority list is it's loose. We're not asking anyone to rank things one, two, three, four, five, and then be locked into that right now. We want to get a feel for the whole board about which of these is more important than others, but. It's a good question, but there is a connection between those two groups. Keely? The current state of affairs is how Mountain Transit provides buses and bus drivers. So presumably, if we went to a self-performing model, 
we could decide that we always use bus drivers in the afternoon, first priority, to bus students from the school building to their homes. And if we then have enough bus drivers that we do buses for extracurriculars and sporting events. Um, because of how Mountain Transit does things, I mean, I suppose we could also write it into our contract that unless you're staffing us at this level for curricular, we're not gonna pay you to bus our sports teams. And that that might put some pressure on them to change their business model. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in the current state of affairs, this is not linked to the curricular transportation, but it doesn't mean that it, like, it's not something that we could think about in theory as part of the overall world of transportation, just like walking routes and safe bicycling is in theory a part of school transportation. So if you weren't going to transport kids to sporting events, that means you can't offer sports. Right. I don't. Well, it means that it said, means that students would have to. We want to go down. Right. But I mean, I don't think that's necessarily the outcome of not having buses is that you, you would not be able to field sports teams. We're currently saying that people have to carpool if they want to get their kid to school in Essex Junction. Right. We, could, we would then be saying you have to carpool if you want your kid to participate in sports. To go to an away game? Mm -hmm. In theory, yeah. I mean, we and may... It's, what we are may, your priorities? It, we may be looking at that some years down the road yeah. in Vermont. It's just, it's, it's the Darth of drivers, and that may become a reality. And we, we need to craft a policy that is not just going to deal with the situation we're in now, but ideally is going to last us through the next five to 10 years without major changes to it. And we have to be realistic that we have discussed and thought about. There's a strong possibility that the driver situation is going to only get worse and that, that may become a reality. Um, we've also talked about, and I think it probably may get more involved than the other, and I, I don't think, Brendan, it was at the last meeting it was over i was on via skype but i mean we need to need to consider that right now like westford for example is handled by one busing company who you know and they're you know they're small and they're local and they're very well known but if they decide to retire or if something bad were to happen and they were in a car accident and those two individuals were gone tomorrow then all of s all of westford all of a sudden has no busing Mm -hmm. And that's a reality. Uh, we, it's one that the policy has to be able to address. We need to be more flexible with it right now because our current contract is just renewed year to year with them. And we don't know. We did that on purpose yeah. because we heard it doesn't have to be year to year. We right. did that. Right. And, but, you know, it, because it's set up structurally different from the others and it handles K through 12, for Westford, it's just you know if yeah. if they go out of business tomorrow, then we're in you know a major issue. We need to know where we're focusing our resources. So, so before we move on to the next slide and the last question for this discussion tonight, are there any other thoughts that people want to share, Martha? Right. <laughs> so, I've thought about this a ton, and oh this really? Is <laughs> a ton? This is totally impractical. But as one district, the people I most want to transport are the people who wouldn't get to school if you don't provide transportation. And that doesn't fit to, into any practical scheme. Right. Um, I think a huge struggle is that Essex Junction students have always gotten to school without transportation. Um, and uh, it doesn't seem equitable not to be transporting them. And yet, there's sidewalks here and um, things that have, don't exist in at all in Westford mm -hmm. and in lots of parts of Essex Town. So I don't know what the answer is. Um, it certainly doesn't feel good to have said we're going to provide transportation 
as, as part of this merger, which we didn't have to say, but we did, um, and not be doing it. Um, so I, I think this is a difficult conversation with no evident answers, in my opinion. Okay. Okay. Brandon. Yes. Um, not to be forgotten on this side of the table. Um, I guess I put my priorities as um, I'd throw the entire former school district borders out the window and start over. Okay, quite frankly, if we're going to do equity, then let's do that. Okay, um, if it's a matter of getting kids to school that can't get there, let's look at it as, a, as an issue. I don't care if kids got there before or not. Kids will get there. Their parents will indeed provide that transportation if they have to, by foot, bicycle, or whatever. Um, so the fact that kids have always gotten there, well, you know, Vermonters have always gotten their kids to school, no matter what the conditions were. So I guess I'm feeling a little put out, um, given where I live on a non-sidewalk street. Um, so I guess in the end, my second priority is to get those kids, the youngest kids, to school. Um, and I guess I'd look at expanding it there are discussing the tuition students because quite frankly our bottom line is dependent and our availability of having the programs at the high school being a former u46 member i know that we can't provide the ex education that we expect have come to expect without having those tuition students here and as the population declines it will become even more imperative so and there's less kids now than there were when I was here at U46. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that would be my priorities as to, to doing it. Um, I'm trying not to be parochial, okay? But I do have to represent the people who voted me here. Great. And they're not, they're paying for stuff they're not getting. Anybody else who would be getting out services and they aren't paying for what they're getting, they'd be a little ticked off. I'm getting a little ticked off. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for that. Okay, so let's move to the last slide and the last question of the evening for this agenda item. Um, one of the things that we talked a lot about or was talked a lot about at the last meeting and we've been talking a lot about is contingencies. You know, we did our intention um, ever since our conversations on the Red Study Committee has been to provide transportation to the district our reality is different the reality of our our ability to deliver on that is has been um, inhibited so if we go to the next slide um, we'd like to have a conversation with you about help us understand your thinking about what are the contingencies that are most important to you so if the administration doesn't have the resources to provide transportation district wide how can we rank these contingencies the first one being limit population served by age or grade level enlarge walking zones which means you increase the service area distance meaning fewer kids get covered by your transportation plan reducing convenience in favor of greater efficiency so it might be harder for you know student a or b to get to a stop but by having more stops or, or more efficient routes might mean that that student needs to travel farther to get to a route or a stop and maybe there are other contingencies that we haven't thought of keely the other one that I, I forgot it was in my notes to you but I didn't notice that it didn't make it into this list the other thing that was discussed a lot last week um, with Brian and Jamie was the possibility of an opt-in approach to transportation um, the extreme of that would be a fee-based opt-in for people who aren't on free and reduced price lunch um, where if you're like within a certain zone you have to subscribe to transportation but the idea of opt-in being 
you have to make a commitment. You can change your commitment given X number of weeks notice. Right. But you have to and commit that, that you are going to ride rather than inform right. to not ride. That was for the outermost ring. Well, that was Jamie's theory. You could mm -hmm. do it for the whole district. Or you could just do it in areas where there's like spotty population. Very, very small population, but large distances. Right. Yeah, so speaking for, you know, I think speaking for Brian and Jamie and the challenges that they face is that, you know, um, in the face of, of a driver shortage and the expectations that we've set forth, they, they need some direction in terms of what is the... Um, what is, you, what is your, um, oh, no, I can't think of the word, <laughs> tolerance for, for these kinds of contingencies? And where, where should they focus their efforts in the event that we're not able to serve the entire district? Andre? Um, I understand clearly what you're suggesting, but I don't, I'm not enamored with that idea because going to Diane's comment that folks are paying for services that they're not receiving, that in essence is what's going to shift, that people are going to be paying for a service that they're not receiving, but if they want it, they have to pay extra. Um, I, I no, think I, I was, I was just mentioning, well, that was, he gave us examples that in Massachusetts, transportation is provided to kids outside of two miles from school. And if you want to be transported inside of that, you pay a fee. Right, so you have to uh, opt into the service and pay a fee. We could have right. opt-in without charging a fee, where you just you have to commit that you want to ride in order to have a bus stop right. scheduled for you. Right, right. But going along with that, I think the question again still comes down to efficiency. If we're having a 60-passenger bus transporting 15 students, but the dilemma is that, that we have two different vendors and we also have a shortage of bus drivers. And that's the shortage of bus drivers is what is really driving the issue. So if we go by looking at the population by age or grade level to ensure that say K through six, K through eight get transported, then someone we're gonna have to shift the drivers and then the high school is going to be at a different level or not getting transported uh, and it's going to be a departure from what people have come accustomed to yes that's, well, and that's exactly the question we're trying to sort of think about is that if if we decide as a board that we wanted to, that that our first priority is k i'm making this up k through six or k through five then that means that the resources are focused there district-wide which would then mean some people losing service that they may have grown accustomed to. Right. So I wonder if <clears throat> Jamie and Brian have looked at high school transportation in Essex Town being done the way it is in Westford. In Westford, you have to get your kid to a central location in order to be transported. You know, so mm -hmm. I think that's an, an inequity, if you will, that we haven't even discussed. Um, it, that is how it is now. Uh, the S there's no more door-to-door -door stops anywhere. So the S former Essex Town High School students do have to go to a centralized neighborhood stop, yes. as it were. If they if on Brigham Hill, I don't think so. In some developments, there is in one developments, designated site. Yes, but if they are in a place like all of Westford, they're getting door-to-door -door service right now. The kids on Brigham Hill and Brigham Hill Lane or Sleepy Hollow or Route 128, well, Westford's picking them up. Yeah, but, but I think those are um, relatively limited in the town, those door-to-door. Those -door. Otherwise, it's centralized. Well, yeah. Brian is aware that the yeah. most vigorous congregated stop is in Westford, where everybody has to get to a central location. Sure. Um, that would be an issue of number three. 
that mm -hmm. as we get more drivers, we can get more granular and Westford could have more than one location for high school pickup. We as we have fewer drivers, you could get to congregated stops with larger get there yourself zones, which are currently called the walking zone for a bus stop, for a congregated bus stop, but acknowledging that it's a get there yourself Zone. And Westford <laughs> hits parents drive you there, yeah, right. and then you get a bus. There is an aspect of this that we haven't touched on that Jamie and Brian brought up in our meetings, and it has to do with the fact that the bus drivers tend to be older adults. They have health issues, diabetes, and other things that are ongoing throughout the year. This shortage is not going to go away and it's going to be here for the long term, and that's the feeling. Uh, and so the solution may be something that we have to get creative about. I don't have the answer there, but I think it's not only Essex Town and Westford and other people that are at risk here, but this system is not getting better. And I'll pass to Patrick. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Certainly, I'm known for speaking frankly. Um, I realize, and I think everyone on the transportation subcommittee realizes that none of these are not only less, I you know, one is less ideal than another. We realize that none of these are good options. Right. Um, what we're kind of here tonight doing is that we're asking which of these bad options is one that the board is going to be able to live with because I think there's going to be some impact it may be some positive impact if we get the high school time changed for next year but that's about the only positive impact that we see coming down the road potentially for years right. um, you know and I've been here on the ground floor of this transportation discussion you know sitting in with meetings with Brian, you know, uh, quite extensively. So I think my background knowledge on this is pretty good. We are at some point going to need to look at this and we are going to need to decide, okay, we need to figure out that our priority is either getting K through whatever grade level we can afford with bus drivers and we need to apply it universally across the district. And there are going to be big changes for everybody. Um, I mean, it's it's not going to be limited to one area. Eventually, the Westford you know bus company is probably going to either switch owners or something's going to happen later down the road. What we're asking the board to do is, you know, look at these options, decide which of these we can tolerate, which we can live with, because we're never going to get to a point probably where we're going to be able to provide full service everywhere. Please remember the opt-in option because Brian and Jamie are really big on yeah, the opt-in. Yeah, that's right. Right now we are servicing, we're, we're assuming that we are trying to provide for 100%. The opt-in would be every year we go to the families and we ask, are you going to be using transportation this year? And if we don't hear from you, then we, you know, you don't get it. Um, you know, and that's probably another big change that I think Brian and Jamie agree would I did add that to the slide but the yeah. slide has not refreshed um and the, the very last thing i would mention is that when we're looking at this because age and grade level is up there um we have seen i think as a board but it might have been in a policy subcommittee is that high school students by far use the have the lowest frequency of using transportation yes. so if we are thinking about this uh, it's going to be really good for us to bear in mind that the youngest riders are the ones who use the buses the most often. So if we are thinking of in any aspect of providing it to high school as, you know, one of these priority levels, that the frequency of riders is significantly less than we would, my personal opinion is we'd be better focused on the younger students. Well, and we saw that in Jamie's report where yeah. he reported mm -hmm. some of the early ridership data is that you know as soon as you get to the higher grades it starts to tail off and yeah, of quite a bit so, I think in listening to the conversation there's two separate issues going on I think one we need to have a conversation before budget time the future of busing and how we're going to cope with it 
I did run into another school board member in a rural area and they own their own buses they hire their own drivers and those drivers work in the schools so the drivers are there they're getting paid we don't want to look at money I don't want to know that we've got to increase money we got to do something because we know the future so that's something we need to look at and it should be done soon the other thing is we need to make a decision on policy for the near future for what's going to happen the near future so we got to be working on two separate issues so I honestly think um, the other thing that we miss is Burlington does all transportation within Burlington using um, city, bus. city the, buses. Yeah, and you know, if we did it and did it right, especially with Essex Junction being so consolidated, if we could get that, trans that type of transportation, I mean, we could get aides to be on those buses so the little kids could even ride it, or at least middle school. You know what I mean? I mean, we could get... And it's open to middle school now. It's open to middle school, open yeah. to middle school yeah. now, yeah. so. But even younger ages, I mean, if we did it and did it right, I mean, that's, that's a wave of the future is public and transportation. We might have to go that route and pay for those passes so and aids so that the kids are safe getting to school i just don't know if green mountain transit it's ever gonna run routes that go through neighborhoods they're just not going to do I know. that and they're not coming to westford i can tell you that um so brendan i'm just worried if we limit by age level that we're really going to, I, I think it's different to be an eighth grader in Essex Junction or in parts of Essex Town where you can walk to school than it is to be an eighth grader in Westford or other parts of Essex Town where you can't walk to school. So I think doing it by grade level doesn't really think about equity as we are starting to talk about it. So I like the idea of exploring opt-in. That just makes sense to me. Um, I think considering increasing the distance zones as long as you do it in a way that considers whether people have sidewalk, the infrastructure. And I think reducing convenience in favor of great efficiency is fine. Um, I am concerned about time though as well. I don't know if this is still true, but um, a neighbor's grandson in kindergarten if he takes the bus, has to be on the bus for 75 minutes. I, you know, that doesn't seem good to me either. So this is such a complex subject. It's just I mean, like discouraging. I said, it's, it's which options we can live with. And they're, none of them are really good. That's, right. that's, it. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I think that Diane's point is very salient about um, ignoring the lines of the earlier districts um, that right. instead of thinking about infrastructure in a given community we have to think about the safety of individual students trip to school because right. there are students who are experiencing equivalent scenarios in different communities and receiving different levels of service the example that you gave for instance that all Westford students in high school have to get to one congregated stop well, we don't have that expectation for Essex Town because we figure those Essex Town students, we know they're not walking there. Like their parents are going to drive them somewhere right. or it's they're the going to get a bus West in Westford. Side. Their parents are going to drive them there because they aren't walking there. Well, there are parts of the village that don't actually have 
plowed sidewalks and they might have more people on the road than somebody in an equivalent street in the town. So if we ignore what municipality you're in and just say these are the criteria that are not safe enough and we need to provide transportation mm -hmm. for this kid, then I would be a lot more comfortable with like the legality of what we're doing I, from a policy I, perspective. So I agree. Yep. Um, the more that we can talk about criteria yeah. um, mm -hmm. and the less that we can talk about community, I think the better. We well, saw, also advocating with the communities to make things better for safety. And we right. saw policies that do that. detail some of that criteria. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. And that's why I think doing grade levels doesn't work. I, I, think, it's, I think it's about what, uh, what's, the, what's the opportunity to get to school and how safe is it, regardless of what and where you live. Well, if I could, Martha, I guess I'm, I'm, I would be a little confused on how are you going to be necessarily ranking that? Because, I mean, just as an example, I know that there are ELL parents who live in Essex Junction who are on the far side of Five Corners who go to Hiawatha. They don't have the capability of driving their own children in kindergarten to school, and they are a two and a half mile walk in the winter. So, so they should be transported. Right. But I mean, how are we, in your scenario, if we're not doing this by age or grade level en masse, that means that we're looking at each individual circumstance like that and then deciding how necessarily i mean i'm just not sure that that's something that the transportation manager who is one individual is conceivably ever going to be able to do for an entire district year to year like I, we we do need larger guidance in this my personal preference is age by grade level just means that because we know the youngest riders use the transportation the most frequently that's where we're putting the most bang for our buck. I mean, I, I do appreciate, you know, what you're saying about parents in Westford who don't have sidewalks. But I mean, when I was a kid, I lived on a highway and I just rode my bus on the side of the road and it may not have been particularly bike. safe. Yeah, but I mean, I rode my bike to Linden Institute every day. It was six miles. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's not like I'm talking about, you know, 1932, where it was uphill both ways. I mean, this was 1998. <laughs> you know, it's not like it was terribly It's a windy road. <laughs> <laughs> it probably wasn't just. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't great. But I mean, you know, there, there are always going to be ways that we could, you know, that kids are going to get to school. And I just think that we need to do, or the administration is asking us to, provide them with some guidance that's going to be larger and en masse because the scenarios that you mentioned are, are true and they're valid ones, but I don't think that we have the capability of deciding on a case-by-case -case basis of each individual child whether or not, yes, you qualify, no, you don't, because you have one parent who does work, but they don't go into work until 9 a.m., so you can get your kid there in the morning, and it just it, it starts becoming so specific at that point that I, I don't I don't think Jamie and Brian could handle it. But how is that different than the opt-in discussion? I mean, I missed the opt-in discussion, but how is it different from opt-in? Isn't that what opt-in is about? Right. Um, it's not in my head, but I'm not sure I can wrap my head around the good explanation for it. Really? I'd say that the theory of opt-in is that you achieve an instant jump in efficiency mm -hmm. by um, making people have to take steps to commit to transportation. And we can, um, on sort of a more blanket level, reach out or make it opt out for people who we know have barriers to access education, whether that be non-English speaking parents or poverty level incurring free and reduced price lunch and then just for most people in the district you have to take a step in order to be counted because currently like if if i ignored this survey that was sent out on the 10th he has to plan to pick up my kids even mm -hmm. if i ignored the survey because i figured oh i'm not going to ride the bus i'll ignore the survey right mm -hmm. and there might be a large percentage of people especially at the high school level 
that he's planning to transport them and it's a waste of everybody's bus time. Yeah, and I was sorry. Opt-in can also be something that we ch a parent can choose, even if they don't necessarily need to use it, just because they don't feel like getting up in the morning to drive their kid to school. Thank you. I agree with Keely's <coughs> first statement about agreeing with me, but I would then, <laughs> um, um, since this is policy, okay, and you're asking about priorities and writing policy, I think we also need to look at some other policies because they impact how this one is operational. Um, and of course procedures, you know, dealing with policy are always important as to how it's going to be implemented, uh, which is some of what we're talking about right now, is how is this policy going to be implemented. Um, but our drawing districts are a key component to this. Patrick making a, a, a statement, you know, that it can, could be indeed three miles from Hiawatha, um, living all the way up there in Fairview or in some of the other streets up up in the, up near the Essex town village line, um, as to how they're going to be getting down to Hiawatha. Um, I recall various drawing districts discussions in the village for decades as to how my neighborhood used the flip-flop between Summit Street and Hiawatha. Well, they at least flip flop the whole neighborhood. So carpooling was a little easier um, than the kid next door going, actually the kid next door before they moved used to go to Hiawatha. Um, whereas the kid down the street was going to Summit Street and this was only last year. So I, I think we need to understand how that one is also going to work. Um, perhaps we need to rearrange how our schools are, are oriented. You know, is this still gonna be K-3? You know, are we going to, as Essex, the former Essex Town School District used to have buildings where um, cohorts, you know, with, with K-2 and 3-5 and whatever else. Um, so I think we need to examine a whole bunch of things as to how we're organized, um, especially if we're going to go on a 10-year on a outlook from right now. Um, you know, if it's, we're looking two years out from now or 10 years out from now, it's quite frankly quite a bit different. Um, so, I, I'm sure there's probably a few other policies that probably come to mind if I started to look, but um, that's my preference. Okay, I'm going to ask that we wrap up this discussion. Yeah, thank you. I'm sure it's going to have, um, I'm sure we're going to continue it um, for many months to come, I'm afraid. So let's move on to the superintendent's report. Yes, I was going to get to the agenda, but okay. I guess. Okay. So I have the superintendent's report, and I also um, on top have a policy that I want you to just quickly look at, and I will be talking about it. I'm going to report out on it on the K-8 voluntary school reassignment policy because I think it's important that you understand. I think I gave too many that way. Oh, two? It's okay. If you run out, you might have to get up. I think there's two. I need stretch. the second Four one. down that way. Kim? I am oh, going to do it? this yep. report quickly because of time. I did want you to, um, I wanted to share a video with you on PLC instead of hearing my voice that you hear the mother of PLC. Um, who is Becky DeFore, but we could put that off to another time. But I wanted you to understand that um, there's four questions that are asked in a PLC so that this is what our district is doing when they get together, especially in the collaborative times and at the school level. They're asking what do we expect our students to learn? So that's looking at proficiencies in the curriculum. They ask, how do we know that they're learning it? That's looking at assessments, formative assessments, and having those conversations. And then how do we respond when they don't learn it? And then how do we respond when they already know it? So those are the four questions that they really, even though it's three bullets, but there's two <laughs> questions in the last bullet that they really get into in PLCs. And I would, um, Becky Dufour just explains that really well. So at Essex High School, oh, they're also examining practices, and that's a really solid K through eight. Essex High School is still working together 
Um, they're all together in a space. They do break out into content areas after about um, in the later half of the two hours. But together they um, are reading Building Equity also. I'm working with them on that. We have Reed Dwyer coming in doing some work um, around proficiencies and assessments. They're going to begin to look at school-wide data, attendance, um, and things like that. Grades overall, but not um, student-specific or content area, but really school-wide and thinking about equity in those ways. So they're tying that in. Um, through the equity or the creating the equity plan. So as Amy alluded to in her presentation, we're still working with how are we going to measure those measurable outcomes. We did not want to hold back on what we wanted for measurable outcomes and only thinking of the data that we can gather. We really related it to our um, continuous improvement plan and looking at our values and aspirations. So we didn't want to hold back. We know that we have a lot to, of work to do around those measurable outcomes and beginning those conversations with our leadership team. I think that's on an agenda for November for them to help us think about how we can um, gather that data. We do have Title I funds. It was approved, uh, Title IV funds, I'm sorry, to, um, it's about $27,000 to have the act um, so every student will be able to take the ACT, te the, that test. It's not guaranteed another year, so when we get our title funds, I'm sure you know as board members, that um, fluctuates from year to year. We don't always have Title IV funds, but we thought what a great use to do that, and it was approved, and that was pretty exciting. Um, we are beginning under my communications goal, um, we are beginning to and I'm hoping that it's a November issue that we can get out a monthly newsletter to families from the district level. Um, we do that to all staff members bi-monthly, bi-weekly. I always get confused with those. <laughs> twice a month. Twice, yeah, twice a month. Eight, seven, 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 <laughs> but we do want to um, do that for families also. It highlights students, it highlights staff, and it will also let people know from my perspective what's happening, similar to this report. So I'm excited about getting that going. Um, my own professional growth as a goal, I did um, the New England Association of School Sup um, Superintendents was at the end of um, September, it was in Stowe. My co-president had a family emergency and wasn't able to go, mm -hmm. so I had to facilitate the whole thing by myself. It's good professional <laughs> responsibility for me, though. Um, and the National Principal Supervision Academy that I'm enrolled in, I have, um, I've had one meeting with my coach via Skype. And I have a PLC on Friday that I'm really excited with from people from all over the United States, which is pretty cool to learn from. I have um, Wendy Cobb has agreed to learn with me and go through this, and she's chosen a teacher, so we will get in the classroom and look at it. We'll start to write our theory of action. Um, we've been looking at data together, and both of us, every time we meet, are so excited about the work that we're doing to really have an impact um, on teaching practices. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then for the next board meeting, November 6th, I'll be in D.C. At, at my learning. So you can think of me learning while you're all here. <laughs> I'll be doing my reading at night. And then I do want to just point out one of the promise of mergers and our policy that we worked on this year with the policy committee, the K-8 voluntary school reassignment. I gave it to you just so you had reference to it. Um, but we have 21 families accessing that within our district. Um, and it's, so it's from Westford Town Village. Um, they've made movement through the town or into the village or from Westford. Um, and they've decided to either stay or take advantage of going to a new. But um, it's mainly about can we keep our child here if we move to the town. And it's been great because people have been asking prior to the move. Um, and they're so excited when you can, I can say yes. And I check with the principal and I do everything with the policy. Um, I make sure the, the class sizes are balanced and all of that. But it's mainly kids that are already there. So they're already balanced and they're already accounted for. But it's really nice to be able to work with families on that. We ha so we have 16, um, yeah, 21 families. It's 27 students. 
and some of the reasons why 16 are the moves within um, the district and then there's five personal reasons either family circumstances um, and I can't get into detail with that and then some social and emotional needs that students have needed so with we've either moved their school by their choice and what they wanted to do and that's been really helpful um, so that's been that's been exciting to have so thank you for that policy and then um, let's see I just noted some things that we're doing on the leadership team so you um, have an idea of the kinds of things we're doing with the principals so as you know we have two meetings a month with the principals one is invites all the directors to it um, so we have food service there and um, curriculum finance and all of that and then we meet Brian and I do meet with our directors um, also so it's just like central office admin and the kinds of things we're doing with them and we're working on on our strengths and then also Right now, it's really mainly about budget and how do you work with principals and what are questions you can ask and how do you reach out to them and all that. I think last year we just dove into it and we've learned from those experiences. So we're really trying to work through a better process. Questions, comments? Sounds good. Kim? I'm just wondering, um, being an almost head to college mode for the last kid, um, will we be communicating to families the availability of the free ACT? Yes, we, need, we want the date first. So right now we're working with ACT on the contract and receiving a date. Once we have that, then we'll be reaching Is out. Is it likely that it's spring then? I'm just yes, thinking it's that spring there could time. be Is it families. Spring time? It's spring time. I mean, it's offered several times a year. Yeah. So yeah. I just didn't know. We just need dates. Even if we were to give families heads up, yeah. juniors, families heads up, it could save them from making an investment that they yeah. might otherwise prefer yeah. to wait till So we just found out that we have the title yeah. funds and it's, it's committed exciting. to that. It's exciting and I think we people just will be happy to hear day. about it. Yeah. And I know that it's the type of thing that juniors are, yeah. and their families are planning about them for. Yeah. And I think it really has to do with equity too. When we heard the authors, Absolutely. it's something that they were doing and it was like, ooh, mm -hmm. we could do that. Yeah, so. no, that's great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? <coughs> okay, let's move on to you it says it right in the beginning. All right, next yeah. is the VSBA resolution. So we went through all of them last time. Last one was about health care negotiations, the statewide negotiations. And we asked Kim to do some follow-up. Kim has gotten back to us. Um, so I think um, one of our biggest questions was, was the size of the district going to be considered in voting or was it just going to be one vote per district even though one district might have 4,000 students and another district might have less than 100 mm -hmm. so and a comparable number of teachers so the answer is that Right now, the SBA is thinking one vote per district. So we asked how the Vermont NEA is going to do ratification, and Nicole doesn't have an answer. Have an answer. So um, I, I was thinking that we should at least raise this issue at the annual meeting and see where the discussion goes. Was there a second thing? There were four or five questions, but um, so uh, the first we posed, it's negotiated at the state level, why can't it be ratified there in the law? And you probably saw from the article that she sent, it was pretty well laid out what, and that was in the newsletter, um, the interpretation of the law and the VSBA's role in it and the need for there to be a, a 
procedure for ratification. Um, the attempt at what was put out was reflective of sort of the way other things are voted on at the state level for BSBA, so not waiting, but rather just per district, there's a vote. Um, and the, I made the point of Kim that this is very different because nothing else we vote on costs us <coughs> money, so. Understood. Um, and I imagine it'll be interesting because it may we it may come up. We could certainly raise it, and I find often at the VSB um, annual conferences, you see some of the amazing diversity across the state and the size of boards and the issues that they all face. So um, I don't often find that being from Chittenden County, there's a whole lot of sympathy for our right. large district size issues. Yeah. It, frankly, um, like when when in a room with a lot of boards from all over the state. So that's a little bit more just for us to think about as we're presenting that idea to be sensitive to um, being able to be heard right. on that issue. Um, and the um, it, it'll be determined in ground rules what the process will be, whether it's we negotiate in executive session, some districts do not, and I don't think it's yet determined whether the statewide negotiation will be in an open forum or in um, an executive session. That will be to be determined in the ground rules. Um, we And we don't know yet how the NEA intends to um, ratify their side of the contract. Um, so I think Nicole came, the process that she put forth and discussed with our board was in trying to take into account whatever guidance was provided in the law whatever parallels could be drawn with other practice when VSBA is trying to represent broad districts across the state, and then um, applying what we knew of the law and coming up with the best thing we could think made sense. So I, I think us bringing those questions before the bigger group is completely fine. Um, there wasn't a whole lot more information that was going to cause there to be a change in the language from either the board or um, executive director's side, but I think they're open to hearing if there's something else that makes sense and falls within the law. Right. So, um, what do folks think about raising the issue and then giving Patrick some leeway depending on how the discussion goes? Um, I think, from what I recall of it, it's um, each district or supervisory union that gets a vote. It's just like at the annual meeting. So, so if we don't want to offend people coming from small communities from like the Northeastern Kingdom and stuff, could we use Stowe as like the example of a small community <laughs> that is getting? A vote, because I mean it, the unfairness doesn't only go one way. There are also like rural communities with small populations that are in big supervisory unions, and that are going to get less of a vote than Stow. Yeah. So. Well, and it's by SU, so I'm trying to think what's SU Stow is in. Lamoille. Uh, so there's like only one other district in that, right? Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, it's a consolidated. District, it's Elmore. Morristown is the other part of that issue. But I think that makes sense anyway to think about how it's. It's supposed. pretty random compared yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Everyone comfortable with that? Okay. And the only other piece I would add is that that will have to be resolved at that meeting. So. Right. Um, whatever we or you guys sitting together at the table come to, you know, we'll have to. Sorry. It's the entire resolution, and I think we were in agreement with everything but the ratification process. So hopefully that'll work out. Um, okay. Sure. Task team updates, communications. 
communications. I have a number of stuff that Liz sent along. Actually, I guess two things. Um, but given how late it is, I'll try to be relatively brief. Um, VFE had a meeting last night that I unfortunately could not attend, but they were finalizing the structure and the outreach for the community summit that they're going to be putting on, which is taking the place of the community conversations that had last year. Uh, this one in particular is going to be a summit focused around diversity. Um, ideally, I think four hours on a Saturday morning um, with uh, a lot of large community stakeholders, you know, local police, you know, district, uh, you know, uh, part of the school system, um, you know, uh, trustees, select board members, etc. Um, I apologize because I had it's December first. Yes, at the time. I was able to be there last night, um, and we didn't think I was going to be able to be here for this part tonight. So <laughs> it was. It's. It'll be December first, and it's eight thirty to. Um, 12.30 with lunch after for people who want to stay. The training for people who want to facilitate is November 3rd, I believe. And I think that that is from like 8.30 to 3 or something like that. It, it could be that that training will be shorter, but um, I think the ideal is that we would have 10 sets of adult and student co-facilitators, hoping that we have 10 tables of 10. And it will be at the summit itself will be at the middle school um, with a target of ideally 100 people <coughs> reaching yeah. out through all the partners and people we could brainstorm. At Essex Middle School? Um, it, the event will be at Essex Middle School. I'm not, uh, the training will be, I think, at e JRP. Okay. Um, and then the other communications uh, topic that we're going to relay is that as a communications committee, um, Liz Keeley and I have talked about uh, not just outreach communications um, from the board to the community, but also how we as a board communicate with one another. Um, and she, uh, Liz met with uh, Martha um, and developed and Kim. Kim. Sorry, Kim. That's okay. Because <laughs> um, I know, I think the idea actually came from the former um, Essex Town School District, um, that after each meeting that there would be uh, just a, a brief uh, series of questions about how an individual, you know, you felt as a board member, how the meeting went, you know, whether you felt respected, whether you felt like your voice was heard, whether or not, you know, the meeting was done. Um, you know, there are a couple, there are a list of questions. Um, that uh, I believe the details are still being hammered out a bit as far as exactly what's going to be on there, but we don't anticipate that they would take any more than a minute or two to just quickly go through, fill out. But it's just a way to provide feedback on more than a year-to-year -year basis. Mm -hmm. You know, the big self-evaluation will still happen. This is just a way to, you know, take the temperature of the board after each meeting, see how it's we get. It's also a way to help us think about how is the board focused on the essential work of school boards or are we getting into areas that we shouldn't. Um, so it'll be a lot for those who are in the bread study. It will be something like Brian had us do short, um, you know, rights. Uh, I don't, what did he call them? Like a quick write, I, I don't know, as yeah. Brendan, it was like We a, would just write, a, a, yeah. <laughs> write a reaction to the meeting uh, yeah. and send it to him. This will be a little more focused so you can think specifically, but it will come back to me and um, it will help me think about agendas in the future and what I need to do to lead better. Um, thanks, Patrick. Any questions? I think transportation has already done their thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, and I don't think we have any statewide so updates. We are presenting. <laughs> we might have mentioned it before, but we're presenting um, from um, the VFE work at the um, annual conference. Yeah. Right. We've got um, Jamal and Tess joining us, and me and Beth. Great. And we get to share the experiences and the work that's happening, that had happened and that is happening. Okay. Perfect. Okay.
Um, anything, uh, please note that the next meeting on November 6th is at Essex Ministry. Okay. Um, anything specific for that agenda that wouldn't likely already be on it? Yes. I, every year, I will buy the cards for the holiday for the schools and the district offices. And I take that out of my stipend, my own money, so I don't need permission. But has anybody thought about what we'll do for the staff this year? Because we'd need to decide in November. I think it'd be a good idea to decide. One thing I need to know is, do you want to do anything? How much money is in the budget? How much are we allowed to spend? So, okay. I'll do a little research about the money piece of it, okay. and then we can talk. Okay. I think it was appreciated to do something and, you know, yeah. I thought we got very good feedback. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. You did a lot of work. Too. You did, yeah. Marla, you really did. When, uh, and I don't know, um, we used to do it, we used to check with the PTO ahead to see if there was one of their days of the appreciation week, which is usually also sometime. But don't no, they usually do something around? I feel like they do something, maybe not in all schools, but I feel like they've done something historically that week around the holidays. But maybe it, I'm thinking more this spring. So it might be spring. different. Okay. Brenda? I just want to clarify when the next school board meeting is. November 6th. So we don't have a meeting on the 30th? No. First and third ah. Tuesdays. Yeah. Okay. okay. This month has happens to have. Is there something going on at Essex Middle School that day that we're going to be there to like attend, or are we just? It's because this voting. space is not available. Oh, there's an election. <laughs> oh, that's right. Oh. That happens in the gym, though. Yeah, it's vote. I don't think that's why we're yeah, not this is here. Being used. Something else okay. is happening. I just wasn't sure if there was something cool to look forward to, like no. you know. <laughs> that would be. Yeah, That's voting. That's yeah. Voting we have um, the students will give their report. Um, Grace, Laura, and I met the other day mm -hmm. and discussed their reports and they'll present. Uh -huh. So okay. that's something to look for. Yeah. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's on student voice, right? Um, well, no. <laughs> starting to be, yes. <laughs> yes. And okay. they are doing their research and reaching out. But they'll tell you about that. Okay, <laughs> sounds great. <laughs> All right, takeaways. Um, I think it's assessment. It's um, continue. Well, I would talk about the book we're reading together, and the fact that the faculty is reading it too. Um, and I know something about transportation you have to <laughs> yes i think so unfortunately anything else okay any other business can i just ask a quick question on the 20th that is part of school vacation week i know i am not in town so i just wanted to make sure that otherwise there's a quorum <laughs> like uh, it's school the tuesday uh, schools are out thanksgiving uh, Thanksgiving. Oh, November 20th. It's a Tuesday. Yep. Mm -hmm. but, uh, right. Teachers have been service, but students have not. Students are out. School is that right. the case? Well, let's, why don't you check your calendars and let me know if you're not going to be at the meeting on the 20th. Okay. All right. We are adjourned. Thank you all.